known as the TARP. Witnesses include the Treasury Department official in charge of the program and Special Inspector General Neil Borofsky. This is two and a half hours. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations of the House Financial Services Committee will come to order. Our hearing this afternoon is entitled TARP Oversight, Warrant Repurchases, and Protecting Taxpayers. We'll begin this hearing with members opening statements up to 10 minutes per side, and then we'll hear testimony from our first witness. After that, members will each have up to five minutes to question our witnesses. I will then excuse our witness and invite the second panel of witnesses to give their uh, testimony, and then we'll continue with members' questions. The chair advises members that given the busy afternoon schedule, I'll be keeping everyone, including myself, to five minutes. Any unanswered, uh, unanswered question can always be followed up in writing for the record. Without objection, all members' opening states, statements will be made part of the record. I now recognize myself for up to five minutes for an opening statement. The past month or two, it's been nice to see some good news regarding the TARP. After some upbeat results from the stress test on the largest financial firms, 10 of the largest banks holding companies were authorized to pay back $68.2 billion of TARP funds. If you include smaller banks, a total of over $70 billion has been repaid to U.S. taxpayers. And this news coming after the Treasury Department used more than $200 billion for more than 600 banks to stabilize the financial sector. When Congress enacted TARP last year, we authorized the Treasury Department to request that firms receiving TARP funds issue warrants. This provides an opportunity for taxpayers to share in the upside for their investments. These warrants give us the right to buy shares of a company at a set price at some point in the future, much like an employee stock option. But as you might imagine, whenever the government's the key actor in ex executing these warrants, unlike an employee stock option, there are a number of other policy issues and concerns that we have to be uh, deal with and have to be weighed. Even so, I'm firmly committed to doing all we can to ensure taxpayers are fully repaid. On May 8, Old National Bank Corps became the first TARP recipient bank to repay its TARP funding and repurchase their warrants held by Treasury. The bank paid $1.2 million to buy back these warrants, but what concerned me was a professor from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, Professor Lanus Wilson, analyzed this transaction very closely. He determined that the warrants were worth at a minimum $1.5 million and as much as $6.9 million. So at the low end, Treasury was off by $300,000, and in the worst case, Treasury missed a return of an additional $5.4 million. $5 million might not sound like a lot of money when we're talking about billions of trillions of dollars in financial rescue aid, but if you consider the 600 other banks that will eventually need to repurchase their warrants, this money quickly adds up to a big potential return for U.S. taxpayers. I wrote a letter to Secretary Geithner on June 2nd, urging him in no uncertain terms that he act to protect the taxpayers' investments in these firms by maxima ma maximizing returns on these warrants. I carbon copied SIGTARP, COP, and GAO, and two weeks later I received a joint letter from Special Inspector General uh, Borofsky and Professor Warren expressing their commitment to transparency. They noted a coordinated effort between COP and SIGTARP to review quote, whether those warrant repurchasing procedures provide fair value to American taxpayers, end quote. Early this month, I was glad to see COP issue a report entirely focused on TARP repayments, including the repurchase of stock warrants. Similar to the analysis done by Professor, Professor Linus, COP found in the first 11 banks that repurchased their warrants, Treasury was receiving only 60 per, 66 percent of what they could have received for taxpayers. COP notes that these small banks represent only a fraction of 1 percent of all warrants issued. But if this trend continues, taxpayers could miss out on an additional $2.7 billion worth of returns on their investment. But on the same day the COP report was released, we received some good news when Wall Street Journal reported that J.P. Morgan Chase had decided to pursue repurchasing its warrants through a public option. They were frustrated with the Treasury Department for demanding too high a price for their warrants. I'm very glad the Treasury Department's holding a tough line, especially against the largest of the TARP recipients. And today, Goldman Sachs re re announced they'll pay $1.1 billion to redeem their warrants, representing a return of 23 percent for U.S. taxpayers. That sounds pretty good, but it's, is it enough? I'll keep pushing to make sure every single TARP dollar that helps stabilize our financial sector is fully repaid so that our children and grandchildren are not left with a tab. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, especially the new TARP Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability, Mr. Herb Allison. He has one of the toughest jobs in the country, and I look forward to Treasury's viewpoint on how they weigh these difficult decisions to stabilize the financial sector while protecting taxpayers. And the strong oversight Congress put in place when we cre created TARP 
continues to publish what amounts to thousands of pages of oversight reports, all free and available online, examining every angle and aspect of TARP. Just this week, SIGTARP published their third quarterly report. I look forward to hearing Mr. Borofsky, Professor Warren, and Mr. McCool's testimony today. I now recognize for five minutes the ranking member of the subcommittee, my colleague and friend from Illinois, ranking member Judy Baker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding uh, this hearing today. Uh, the hearing which is, which is intended to focus on a specific uh, aspect of the TARP program, warrant repurchases and protecting taxpayers. It is in the taxpayers' best interest that as soon as possible the federal government gets out of the trillion dollar bailout business and out of the practice of owning and running private businesses. This is something the administration also supports. How soon can we withdraw taxpayer money and end the practice of taxpayers propping up industries? Treasury, the Fed, and the FDIC must communicate to the markets and taxpayers the exit strategy and the timeline for it. We need to put an end to the federal government picking winners and losers in the marketplace, which has facilitated unfair competition, competitive advantages for some businesses, and completely abandoned others. It's also in the taxpayers' interest that Treasury secure the best possible return on its investment. I think we'll hear some criticism from some of our witnesses today that Treasury is shorting taxpayers on the investment. From what I understand, this may or may not be true. The accusation may be more for headlines than, than true and is based on differences of opinion as to what is the best modeling method methodology to value warrants. Whatever the case, taxpayers must be insured, assured that Treasury is using the best means to recapture taxpayers' money. And I hope that uh, Mr. Allison will provide us with those ass assurance today. And I agree with many of our witnesses today that taxpayers deserve transparency with regard to warrants and with regard to what TARP recipients are doing with taxpayer money. At the same time, I want assurances from today's witnesses that as they work to improve TARP transparency and while TARP is still active, they will not jeopardize Treasury and taxpayers' uh, negotiating position to secure the best return on their investment. It is also vital that we prevent any individual, federal entity, or business involved in TARP from making a profit based on insider information, especially when it is at the expense of the taxpayer. That's unacceptable, and I want to know what is being done to prevent this. Finally, I'm disappointed with legislation that would siphon off TARP returns when we still don't have a guarantee that TARP will ultimately, uh, ultimately produce a return or loss for taxpayer. At a time of record deficits and unemployment reaching 10 percent nationwide, any profit on this tremendous risk should first and foremost go towards paying down the deficit. With that, I would like to uh, yield uh, the balance of my time to the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee, uh, Mr. Bacchus. Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Moore, for convening today's uh, important subcommittee hearing on the oversight of the uh, TARP program. And, uh, uh, I'd also like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Biggert's uh, fine service. Uh, she's been particularly, I think, helpful on, on the issues involving the uh, uh, SEC and the uh, uh, CFTC. I thank you. Uh, last fall, uh, Congress required recipients of assistance under the Capital Purchase Program to issue warrants to the Treasury. Uh, I have a particular interest in this program because I first proposed it or something like it on September the 18th uh, and felt like uh, by setting, uh, you know, a dividend or at least a repayment at a certain percent, uh, I felt like we would be best assured of, of uh, receiving a fair return as opposed to uh, a more uh, uh, fluid definition. Uh, for instance, when you buy toxic assets, and I said that in the very first meeting with uh, Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke, you know, what do we price these at? If you price them uh, too uh, low, it doesn't help the banks with their capital. If you price it, uh, if you pay too much for them, it's a bad deal for the taxpayer. So, I've always thought that this was our best opportunity of safeguarding the taxpayers and yet coming to the aid of the banks, and I think time has shown that to be correct. Uh, and I, uh, Chairman Frank and I and others worked on a bipartisan way on this uh, 
uh, along with uh, Representative uh, uh, Roy Blunt. Uh, and this was done so that the American taxpayer would have the opportunity to benefit the warrants, particularly from any upside as these companies return to financial health. And uh, although we, we were hoping that was the case now, some of them have had a spectacular return and you saw today with uh, Goldman Sachs paying back the money, that was a 23% annualized return. Now that's going to be unusual, I think, but uh, it certainly was uh, good news for the taxpayers. Uh, however, many questions do remain about how to properly uh, value these warrants to ensure that the taxpayers receive a proper return on their investment. And I know uh, uh, Ms. Warren or Professor Warren or Dr. Warren, uh, uh, you had proposed that they be placed on the open market for sale to the highest bidder. And certainly that, that is a, uh, you know, one option that, you, you know, has some appeal, uh, particularly if, if the Treasury and the, uh, the party cannot come to some agreement. I think that's probably the only valid option. Uh, and normally I'd be in favor of, of letting the market decide uh, asset values in all cases. Uh, and uh, I do think that the oversight panel's formula for setting the auction price could result in the, holding the, the government having to hold the warrants for an extended period of time. And then you have, to, you have the risk of another economic downturn. So you're, if you knew that the economy was going to continue to recover, uh, are the company's prospects? I'd say yes, but you know, you look at the commercial mortgage market and others, and you're, it's really a gam you're, you're, it's a somewhat speculation. And I've advocated trying to, particularly if the Treasury sets a price and it's accepted, let the taxpayers get their money back. We'll go ahead and get that money back in the Treasury where it can uh, be used to pay down the deficit. Um, in the July report on additional views, uh, my colleague, Mr. Hensling, explained that the valuation of the warrants is a highly complex analysis and that a one-size-fits-all approach may not yield the best results for the American taxpayer. You know, I, I agree that that's, that's true. Uh, while the July report seems to paint a picture that some money may be left on the table, if uh, its if uh, its valuation formula is not used, uh, I believe that a fair, better result for the American taxpayers, I said, is is to go ahead and and as soon as possible get the federal government out of the business of holding stocks and warrants of the financial institutions. Uh, and Treasury's indicated that's also their policy. So uh, to get this the government's investment uh, back as soon as possible. Uh, let me conclude by saying, Mr. Chairman, uh, as institutions begin to pay back their TARP assistance and really capital purchase program uh, monies, we need to end uh, bailouts, return the money to the taxpayers, not recycle the funds back into more bailouts. And part of that will be regulatory reform to en ensure that we don't have any more bailouts. And I think protection of, of uh, consumers is a part of that. Uh, and although my approach differs from Chairman Frank, I believe that, that we, what we ought to be doing is saying to the regulatory agencies, which have the skill and the means and the resources to uh, enforce consumer protection, that we give them the charge to do it and tell us how they're going to do it. And uh, if if uh, over the period of six months to a year we see that's not working, then we could address it in a more sort of, uh, more novel way. Um, but uh, let's be clear about another fact. Although the capital purchase program may earn a profit, uh, the TARP program overall will not. So for that reason, uh, I believe that all these dividend pay payments ought to be given back to the Treasury as soon as possible. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence in my opening statement. And thank you, thank you as well, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Mr. Klein for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing. And uh, this is one of those hearings we should have a lot more press coverage and a lot more attention to the fact that we're having a pleasant discussion about uh, the TARP uh, and the scenario where not only are 
large banks that uh, were probably put in a more solid position after what happened in September. Uh, but their, the consideration now is not only paying back the initial capital, but what's going to happen with the bonus? That's the warrants. And for those people who aren't familiar with warrants, that's obviously that upside that we've been talking about all along. So there's a very positive discussion going on here today, and I'm glad that uh, members of both sides of the aisle can, can recognize that. That doesn't mean that things are good for everyone, but this is uh, a little bit of silver lining to the fact that the taxpayers of the United States who put all this money on the table are going to get not only the money paid back, but uh, will share on the upside. Now, that being said, I want to, in my opinion, and I appreciate the, the witnesses today and had a chance to meet with many of you and talk to you about some of the specifics, and I thank you for your service. It's a very important part of the oversight here, is making sure that the taxpayers receive the maximum return for the risk that they took. Uh, not everybody wanted to go along with this, but we did what we had to do, uh, and uh, those people who said we didn't need to do this, um, uh, it's a matter of history to judge, but at the, at the present time, we want to wish all of our businesses and banks in the United States success. We want them to succeed. We want them to lend more. And a strong message I'd like to deliver to the banks that our TARP recipients is start lending. Start moving along here. I mean, we have a liquidity issue in the United States that still is out there. And whether or not you're paying back the money or the warrants uh, are going to be exchanged in some form or fashion, we need you to be a part of our recovery. Uh, that being said, the fairness part of this is making sure we get the maximum bang for the buck. And whether it's uh, on an auction uh, or whether there's a wait or not a wait, uh, again, I'll leave that to some of the professionals who can help uh, us realize that we get the maximum uh, uh, bit of value back from the banks that uh, end up taking this money. Some of them are now recording historic profits, uh, which again, we wish them all well. Uh, we want that success to uh, filter out to others as well. But uh, we want to make sure that the taxpayers in this country who uh, literally went on the line to make sure the recovery was uh, going to begin, and it seems to be beginning now, uh, that uh, we can put some of this money back in the till and those banks that may need some additional help and other, uh, others around the United States may get that help. But other than that, we get the maximum dollars back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Klein. The chair now recognizes Ms. Mary Jo Kilroy for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for conducting this hearing. Although I was not part of the 110th Congress and voted no on the House plan to release more money from the Trouble Asset Relief Program, I understand that the American taxpayers took on some risk uh, when we uh, worked to bail out the banks, many of whom made decisions that have hurt Ohio's families and hurt Ohio's economy, in fact, the, uh, hurt our, our country's economy. Now, as Main Street still awaits the economic recovery and the jobs that it deserves, some banks are back to making record profits again after receiving our help. And I think that it's appropriate that the American public receives a return on the investment that they made with the TARP money. I find it unacceptable that the downturn hurt Main Street hardest, yet the recovery seems to be benefiting uh, corporate America first. This issue, the repayment of the taxpayers and the upside of warrants is one situation where the taxpayers deserve to reap the full benefits in an open and transparent process. According to the reports that we have received from Dr. Warren, from Mr. Borofsky, the banks and Treasury are ne ne negotiating the repayment of this debt, the purchase and sale of these warrants behind closed doors instead of allowing the transfer and the trading to happen on the open market and allow the market to set the price. We do not know if the current process is producing the benefits we are owed. However, Dr. Warren has found that we are getting about 66 cents on the dollar for our investment and that the total shortfall to our constituents could be as much as $2.7 billion. A market-based approach would remove the secrecy and special interests and maximize the return on taxpayers' investment. That is why I introduced with six of my colleagues what we call the Profit Act. This logical and common sense bill would maximize profits for our taxpayers and ensure transparency by requiring an open process, eliminating the loophole that allows banks to negotiate behind closed doors with Treasury. The public auction would be such a transparent open market, and I think that um, one of our witnesses, Assistant Secretary Allison, uh, stated uh, 
earlier this year in his testimony that in relation to toxic assets on bank balance sheets, quote, we have our theories, but in the last analysis, that's why you have financial markets. You have to have liquid interchanges, and then the truth will come out as to what assets are actually worth, quote. I look forward to today's testimony, and I suggest to the panel and to my colleagues that now is the time to act to close this loophole. According to the Congressional Oversight Panel, which Dr. Warren heads, less than 1 percent of the warrants, those stock options for the American people, have been sold. This is the time to push Treasury, to open the process with transparency, and to make sure Americans get the deal that they deserve. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Kilroy, for your uh, statement. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our first witness, Mr. Herbert M. Allison, Jr., the newly confirmed Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. As Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability, Mr. Allison is responsible for developing and coordinating Treasury's policies on legislative and regulatory issues affecting financial stability, including administering uh, TARP. Uh, Mr. Allison most recently served as President and CEO of Fannie Mae, as well as the Chairman, President, and CEO of uh, TIAA Cref. He has held senior positions at uh, Merrill Lynch, Time Warner, and the New York Stock Exchange. Mr. Allison also spent four years as an officer in the United States Navy, including a year in Vietnam. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record, Mr. Allison. Mr. Secretary, Assistant Secretary, you're recognized for five minutes to provide a brief summary of your statement. Uh, Chairman Moore and Ranking Member Biggert and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss Treasury's efforts to stabilize and repair the nation's financial system. In response to the major crisis in our nation's financial system and housing markets, Congress passed the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, or ESA, last October, establishing the Troubled Assets Relief Program, or TARP, and giving Treasury the necessary tools and flexibility to stabilize the financial system and restore the flow of credit to consumers and business. Our mandate in ESA is twofold, to stabilize the financial system while protecting the taxpayers. Today, I want to update you on our progress. In just 10 months, Treasury has invested more than $200 billion in 657 financial institutions of all sizes in 48 states, including over 300 small and community banks through the Capital Purchase Program. We reopened the Capital Purchase Program recently for small and community banks, recognizing the critical role these banks play in our communities. We provided support to three systemically significant institutions. We launched an unprecedented housing program to help millions of homeowners. We assisted with restructuring of both General Motors and Chrysler through the bankruptcy process. And as a result, both companies are better able to compete today. We helped to restart the securitization markets, a key source of credit to consumers and businesses. We launched a public and private investment program to help remove legacy assets from the balance sheets of financial institutions so they can redeploy their capital to support lending. And we issued regulations guiding executive compensation at all firms receiving TARP funds. We have allocated about $643 billion to our ESA programs. We've actually invested $362.6 billion of that amount to date. We've also received over $70 billion in uh, CPP payments from 34 institutions and $6 billion in dividend repayments from participants in all the TARP programs. And finally, we're beginning to receive proceeds from the sale of warrants through the CCP. And as was noted today, we received $1.1 billion from Goldman Sachs, representing a return of 23.15 percent on the taxpayers' money. As you can see, Treasury has accomplished a great deal, all while building a new Office of Financial Stability. However, we have much more to do, as described later in my testimony. I would like to briefly discuss Treasury's process for selling the warrants it has received through the CPP. I've attached our policy statement and our frequently asked questions on this subject with my testimony for the record. Treasury has communicated its consistent and clear process for valuing warrants in a manner that protects taxpayers. We apply the same process consistently for all banks, large and small. 
Treasury is committed to getting fair value for the taxpayers for these warrants, and we've made that process public on our website. When a publicly traded institution repays Treasury's investment under the CPP, it has the contractual right to repurchase its warrants at fair market value through an independent valuation process directly from Treasury. One source of complexity in valuing warrants is that the warrants do not trade on any market, so they don't have observable market prices. Models by themselves cannot give us reliable estimates of the realizable price in the marketplace. So we're using a comprehensive approach to estimating these values, which involves a variety of inputs, including a set of well-known financial models. In developing our valuation and repurchase process, we counsel with numerous experts, market makers, and industry participants. Treasury also consults with third-party market participants as to what they'd be willing to pay for the warrants, and we obtain full independent valuations from outside investment managers. Treasury decided to sell the warrants within several months after they're eligible for sale, rather than hold them for a substantial period. Our guiding principle is the President's belief that the extraordinary government interventions necess necessitated by the crisis should be unwound as quickly as is consistent with Treasury's mandate under ESA to restore liquidity and stability to the financial system while protecting the interests of taxpayers. As with all aspects of our financial stability programs, Treasury welcomes the recommendations and comments of others as we continually strive for improvement, transparency, and accountability in all of our programs. Earlier this month, Treasury announced its selection of nine asset managers for the Legacy Securities Public-Private Investment Program, also known as PPIP, to remove legacy assets from the balance sheets of financial institutions. The PPIP is a critical element of Treasury's financial stability plan and is designed to support market functioning and facilitate price discovery in the important asset-backed securities markets, allowing banks and other financial institutions to redeploy capital and extend new credit to households and businesses. Treasury took a number of comprehensive measures to enhance the potential of this program and to protect the taxpayer. We consulted closely with the SIGTARP as we developed a robust framework for compliance, governance, and controlling conflicts of interest. Treasury also ensured that the PPIP includes a spectrum of minority, women, and veteran-owned businesses that represent our communities. The TARP has been key to stabilizing the financial system and preventing greater deterioration in the availability of credit to households, businesses, and communities. Amid signs of recovery in the financial markets in the first half, uh, we've seen uh, improvement in spreads, that is the measure of a risk in the financial system. Uh, we've also seen that issuance of corporate debt has increased sharply. There are also some signs that the economy is beginning to mend. Consumer confidence has increased significantly. Housing starts have moved higher. House purchases have begun to pick up in some parts of the economy. Nevertheless, our financial system and our economy remain vulnerable. Even with the modest improvement in conditions, unemployment and the level of home, home foreclosures remains high. Strains in the commercial real estate market continue to build. This is why Treasury must remain vigilant and press ahead with our financial stabilization efforts. Upon taking office, President Obama committed to increased transparency, accountability, and oversight in our government's approach to stabilizing the financial system. Secretary Geithner first, uh, further underscored Treasury's commitment to transparency in all our programs. One of Secretary Geithner and my priorities is to ensure that we enhance and provide transparency as our activities evolve. I will regularly update Congress on our progress. We have productive working relationships with our four oversight bodies, the Special Inspector General of the TARP, SIGTARP, the Government Accountability Office, GAO, the Congressional Oversight Panel, the COP, and the Financial Stability Oversight Board, or FINSOB. Treasury has accepted a great majority of the recommendations of those bodies. Where we conclude that a recommendation is impractical, we find other means to achieve the same goal. Treasury shares the concerns of Congress and our oversight bodies that we see an increase in lending by banks. And we've required banks receiving a Treasury investment to report their lending activities regularly. In January, Treasury launched an important initiative to help the public easily assess 
the lending activities of banks participating in the CPP, starting with the top 21 banks, since they account for over 50% of lending in our communities. Then in March, we expanded the survey to include all banks in the CPP and have now published three lending reports with data from over 500 banks. Because we believe these reports are critical to helping the public understand the lending environment during this crisis, we have asked 10 large banks that have repaid Treasury's CPP investment to continue participating in the survey through the end of this year, and they have agreed, and we appreciate their voluntary cooperation. Treasury is working urgently to maximize the impact of our programs on financial stability, but we must allow some time for these programs to have their full effect. We recognize that we have much work ahead to restore the flow of credit to consumers and businesses and alleviate the real hardships that Americans face every day. As my colleagues and I work on this important financial stability effort, we will strive to be prudent investors on behalf of the American people and to protect the taxpayers who have entrusted us with so much of their money. Here are the top priorities of the Office of Financial Stability. First, we will carefully review the controls over taxpayers' money, giving special attention to compliance with laws and directives governing risks and internal audits. In this regard, we will work closely with Congress and the oversight bodies. Second, we will strive to maximize the effectiveness of financial stability programs, restoring soundness to financial institutions and liquidity to our markets. And finally, we will emphasize transparency and interaction with Congress so that the American people will know what we're doing with their money, why we are doing it, and how it's helping the financial system, the economy, and their lives. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Allison. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Mr. Allison, as you know, Goldman Sachs announced they're buying back their warrants for $1.1 billion directly from the Treasury. Yeah, J.P. Morgan Chase is going to a public auction because, according to news reports, there's a feeling you are driving too hard a bargain, which I'm frankly glad to hear. Is $1.1 billion enough for Goldman's warrants? Would taxpayers have received more if they went to a public auction? Uh, thank you, Chairman Moore, for your question. Uh, it's a question that we ask ourselves all the time. We have, uh, even though we're contractually obligated, uh, to go through this process of independent valuation with the bank if it chooses to do so. If the bank decides it would rather auction the warrants, we are willing to go that route. Uh, we have modeled both approaches. Of course, as I mentioned in my earlier testimony uh, a month or so ago, uh, we can't tell for sure how the market will end up valuing warrants. Uh, we try our best if the process is going to be the uh, independent valuation approach mandated by contracts to get market-based information nonetheless. And so that's why we go out and we ask uh, market participants to give us quotes on these warrants. We are satisfied based on those quotes, based on analysis by independent asset managers, and based upon our own use of valuation models, similar to the, that used by the COP, that this is a very fair price for taxpayers. We are comfortable with that. And uh, uh, although I still can't tell you that we would do better or worse out in the open market, nonetheless, based on a system we use for every bank and have since the beginning, we are very pleased with this outcome. Thank you. Mr. Allison, what's your response to the paper from Professor Linus on Old National, as well as COP's report saying that Treasury could miss out on a potential $2.7 billion worth of returns for taxpayers? What policy issues does Treasury consider when reviewing these warrant repurchases? And also, I've heard some say auctions should be held shortly after earnings season, say early August, providing transparency to all potential buyers. When will Treasury hold these auctions? Uh, in response to uh, our view of the uh, process of the COP, uh, first of all, uh, we use a similar model to the COP. Uh, we respect their approach. Uh, we've had discussions with the COP about ours and about theirs. Um, there are, as the COP report pointed out, small uh, differences in the assumptions that go into a model, especially when you're valuing warrants as long as 10 years, can have a major impact on the result of the valuation. And um, in, in this case, 
uh, one of the assumptions has to do with whether uh, there should be a discount to the price baked into the model because small banks have much smaller warrant positions that we hold and when they're sold there's likely to be less demand, less liquidity in the market and therefore a lower price. Uh, we factor in for small banks a discount for the, the, the lack of liquidity of those warrants. So that's one reason why there could be a difference between uh, the model outcome of the COP and ours. Uh, I would also uh, ask that you look at the comments of various COP members addended to the, uh, to the COP report where they point out some of these issues. I think we have to be, uh, while we're all trying to do our best to value these warrants, we all have to respect the uncertainty of a model and that's why we use alternative approaches such as going into the market and asking real market participants what they think the warrants are worth. And my final question, Mr. Allison, I know you've only been on the job for a month, but have you given any thought to a TARP exit strategy? Do you have any sense of how long we should expect TARP to be up and running? The law creating TARP requires after five years the President must submit a legislative proposal to Congress of how the financial services industry will pay for any remaining outstanding losses on the program. Since we're nearing the one-year anniversary of the law, do you expect that we'll, be, we'll have losses on the program in four years? Do you have any? Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, the uh, ESA legislation provides that uh, at the end of the year uh, we might uh, end uh, making investments in companies. However, the Secretary of the Treasury can make a determination uh, as to whether the program should be extended, that is for making investments, until October of next year. Uh, uh, the Secretary uh, will be deliberating that matter in the fall and will reach a, a decision. Um, I should point out that uh, the features of these investments either uh, contain expiry dates for our investments or increasing costs to the, uh, to, the, to the bank in which we're investing. So there are incentives built into the program for banks to repay Treasury uh, as rapidly as their financial condition allows. Thank you, sir. My time is up. At this time, I recognize uh uh, Ms. Bigert, for any questions she may have for you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, this is sort of um, similar, but Mr. Allison, you know, the, the Treasury is being uh, criticized for not securing the best possible uh, return on its investment. In fact, uh, I think in the uh, Congressional Oversight Panel's, uh, the COP recent uh, report, they accused the uh, Treasury of, of uh, reselling the, the warrants back to the banks at two-thirds of their actual value. Is, um, and is this true? Uh, thank you for your question, uh, uh, Congresswoman Bigger. This is a question many people are asking as a result of that report. Um, we have, as I said, uh, taken various approaches to valuing these warrants. They're the exact same approaches that we took in valuing Goldman Sachs' warrants. And uh, we determined, based on this approach, that we were receiving a very fair value from those smaller banks. And that's why we accepted those bids. And uh, we will eventually uh, be disclosing more information that uh, lay behind those bids and our decision. And uh, we look forward to making that uh, information available down the road. It, is there a difference because of the small banks have probably less liquidity than the larger banks? Uh, yes, that is true. In fact, uh, we did, as I mentioned, apply a liquidity discount in the model. Uh, that was also, by the way, reflected in the market indications that we received. We did not apply a liquidity discount in the case of Goldman Sachs, and we would not in the case of other larger banks, because uh, given the value of those warrants, they're more likely to enjoy a liquid market if they were auctioned. Okay. Can you uh, give the, uh, the taxpayer a the American taxpayer's assurances that Treasury is doing, is using the very best means uh, to uh, re recapture the taxpayer's money? I can assure you that we're making every effort, and this is our obligation to the American public, to receive uh, the, an appropriate and uh, ample return for uh, the taxpayer. We if know they're the ones who put their money at risk, and we feel uh, a great obligation as responsible stewards of their money. Well, you received a fair value, but was it, is there a difference with the best value? We believe that, this, that in each of these cases, 
these were ample values, and we've applied the same standards to all. So we examine each method and the results that it produces, and then we determine what is an appropriate price that we should demand from each bank, and we stick to that price. Um. As I, uh, I mentioned in my opening statement, it's vital that we pre you know, prevent any individual or fiduciary entity or business involved in TARP from making a profit based on uh, insider information, especially when it's at the, uh, the expense of the, of the taxpayer. What, what's the Treasury doing to uh, prevent and track this? We've had uh, many uh, uh, close consultations with the SIGTARP. Uh, we have uh, also uh, invited the SIGTARPS uh, staff uh, to meet uh, with us and the, uh, and the uh, candidates to be asset managers on the PPIP program, for example. Uh, I think we've had a robust dialogue with uh, uh, Inspector General Borofsky and his team about this. Uh, we are charged with promoting financial stability while protecting the taxpayers. Our mandate and the reason for the law is to build and implement programs that are going to eventually help the American public and the financial system. And so with that in mind, uh, we have decided on, a, on an approach where we and the SIGTARP will have the access to trading data across each of the fund managers that we're hiring daily. So we and the SIGTARP can check trading in the various funds of each of these fund managers to see whether, in fact, there are any questionable trades that might cause us to wonder whether we're getting full value for the taxpayer's money, whether a manager is trying to take advantage of our investments at the benefit of one of their other investments. So we have almost real-time ability to intervene. We're also getting uh, certifications from the managements of, of these funds. We are prohibiting fund complexes from having one fund trade with our fund as another control. So we have, we think, very robust controls to protect the taxpayer. In, uh, in Mr. Borowski's uh, quarterly report, uh, which was released yesterday, he highlights the fact that uh, Treasury has declined to institute barriers to prevent the conflicts of interest with the management of the PPIF program. Maybe this was before you have worked something out with him. but. Um, but thinks that this could have serious consequences related to money laundering or could, you, or could lead to uh, increases in government's exposure to losses um, with no corresponding increase in potential uh, profits. Is this accurate? Well, we carefully uh, considered uh, SIGTARP's recommendation. We welcome SIGTARP's ideas. I may say that uh, the SIGTARP has suggested dozens of ideas to us, and we look back and we, we've accepted or uh, in, in a way very similar uh, accepted uh, the SIGTARP's recommendations about three-fourths of the time. There are some cases where we have determined that in the interest of uh, financial stability and because we can find other ways of protecting the taxpayer that uh, we, uh, de we decline to implement. And in one of these cases has been the creation of a wall. Now, in many cases, and here I draw upon 35 years' experience in the financial services industry. In many cases, it makes great sense to have a wall to separate asset managers in one area from asset managers in another. In the case of the asset managers we're hiring on behalf of the taxpayer, we want to have their best talent working for the American taxpayer in the PPIP fund. And, uh, but these managers in these fund complexes are already committed to other funds that they manage. The, the, the uh, fund cannot take them away from those in order to focus on ours. Conversely, if we allowed the best managers to stay with the other funds, we'd have to have them hire other managers without the track records that are the reason why we hired those fund complexes. So we've, we have, instead of having a wall, we provide transparency. The ultimate test, and I've worked with walls, a wall can be defeated by people de determined to collude. Mm -hmm. They can leave the workplace. They can go out in the street and talk to each other. They can use cell phones to talk to each other. Even if you have a wall, you have to make sure the wall is working. 
That's why we're insisting on, manage, uh, on these managers making available their trades across the whole fund complex every day so we have the ability to get total transparency in what they're doing, pin them down right then and there if we see suspicious trading activity in order to protect the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, with all respect, I'm going to have to advise uh, the members and the witnesses that we have, we've just been advised that we have votes being called in the next 15 to 30 minutes. There are six votes which I anticipate will take about an hour. So I'd like to move along here and I would advise <coughs> members and the uh, witness too that they'll have an opportunity to submit additional information for the record written responses if they would please. Thank you. Ms. Kilroy, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Allison, thank you for being here this afternoon. It's my understanding um, that the TARP statutes initially permitted Treasury to convert a warrant to cash or to exercise it when Treasury decided that doing so would allow the public reasonable gain uh, and that the market was optimal for such assets and that the goal of that was to maximize the value for taxpayers. Is that correct? Is that your understanding? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Congresswoman. In fact, uh, the, the law has changed several times since the ESA law was enacted. And uh, recently, we've been given the ability, again, the flexibility, to sell the warrants at a time of our choosing, when we think it's in the best interest of the taxpayers. And do you believe that it is still, this, despite the changes in the law, the goal to maximize return for the taxpayer? We, we believe that selling the warrants uh, relatively soon after we are repaid uh, by the bank for its preferred stock investment, uh, that it is appropriate for us to sell the warrants in a way that will uh, benefit the taxpayers. And the reason for this, one of the reasons is, that a warrant value is based on a stock value that incorporates the market's expectations regarding the future performance of the stock. So even if we sell the warrants over the near term, we're not forfeiting the upside potential of, of the warrant. We also find if we hold the warrant for a longer period of time, and here it gets a little bit technical, the option value of that warrant declines. We also would engage in market timing if we hold the warrant for a long period of time. And we are not in the business of being long-term investors conducting market timing, trying to find the right time to sell a stock. And frankly, there never will be any agreement on what is the right time to sell. Separate so it's better apart to from the timing this. issue, is there an issue in terms of protecting the taxpayer and protecting taxpayer confidence in the process of the methodology by which the warrants are sold or converted to cash? Well, we, uh, uh, again, where we uh, are going to be disposing of the warrants, we first have to follow a contractual process where the bank that issued the warrants has the ability to bid to buy back its warrants. We don't have to accept their bid. In fact, in most cases, we have not. Uh, we, uh, we will let them rebid if they wish, if they decide to no longer bid, then we have the ability to go out and auction those warrants in the open market. The um, contractual process, would, would you agree, gives, uh, is, is more one-sided and gives the banks more authority in setting uh, the methodology for the sale and, uh, of the warrants? Uh, actually, uh, Congressman, uh, uh, I think that puts the Treasury in a very good position to represent the taxpayers. We do not communicate what to us is the price that we require in order to sell in that process. The bank has to bid. We will not accept until there's a bid that reaches our considered price. And at that point, if they reach that price, and some don't, we will sell, and we think at that point we are capturing ample value for the taxpayer. Let me also add that uh, I know there's concern, and, and you voiced it, about whether we're doing this in a closed room. Uh, we are going to be disclosing uh, information about the methodology and the actual calculations that we used in arriving at the appropriate warrant price. I mentioned at the appropriate time. Uh, right now, we're engaged in discussions with a number of large banks. 
we think it's in the taxpayer's interest that we defer that disclosure uh, until a later date. You do understand, uh, would it be your understanding that the Treasury would have no authority to enter into contracts with the banks regarding the TARP money other than that flowed from the statute that set up that uh, program in the first place? I'm aware that all of our actions uh, on behalf of financial stability and the Office of Financial Stability are uh, carrying out the law, uh, the ESA law. And that would include the obligation to protect the taxpayer's interest first and to, to use the, the phrase from, the, from ESA to maximize the return for the taxpayer? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Yield back. The ranking member is recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, have a unanimous consent to allow uh, two members of the General Financial Services Committee, but not of the subcommittee, to participate today. That's Mr. Brad Sherman of California and Mr. Kenny Marchant of Texas. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Bacchus, uh, Congressman Bacchus, excuse me, you're recognized next, sir. Been called a lot worse than that. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Allison, uh, the act we passed back on October 1st, the EESA that includes the TARP and the capital uh, um, purchase plan, uh, it states explicitly that uh, uh, proceeds from the sale of troubled assets and revenues from uh, dividends and the surrender of warrants. Uh, shall be paid into the general fund of the Treasury for reduction of the public debt. And, of course, that was part of the bargain in uh, passing that act. Yes, sir. Um, the Treasury has interpreted that, and this is uh, according to Mr. Uh, Brobsky's uh, most recent report, you interpret that the maximum amount of funding is $299 billion. So as long as you don't you don't have that much funding out that you can replenish the fund as opposed to returning it to the uh, general fund. Is that correct? Uh, the limit that was set on the amount of investments outstanding at any one time is $700 billion. Yeah. Okay. As I mentioned, currently that number is a little over $360 billion. Okay. Uh, we have uh, uh, budgeted to spend about $643 billion to date. Uh, however, we have also received repayments, as you know, of over $70 billion so far, and that together creates headroom uh, under the $700 billion outstanding in one time of about $128 billion to date. So what you, you've interpreted that as uh, uh this, when you get these dividend payments that you don't have to, they don't have to be returned to the general fund? All the monies that we receive are returned to the general fund. And then under the ESA law. Didn't he draw back out? Is that well, under the ESA law, we may make uh, additional investments so long as we do not exceed $700 billion outstanding at any one time. So it, it is deposited in the fund and then it it's drawn out? It is deposited and then there okay. is a new decision and a new allocation. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sure you're aware Chairman Frank uh, has introduced TARP for Main Street. Yes, sir. Uh, which is legislation to use the dividend payments, and I guess the warrant payments, too. I'm not sure about that. To fund uh, several public housing initiatives um, instead of the money being returned to the Treasury. Uh, or was this type of use of TARP, in your opinion, ever envisioned by the Treasury Department? Uh, let me first say that uh, the Treasury uh, is carefully looking at uh, uh, Chairman Frank's uh, proposals. And uh, 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 we uh, also, however, uh, believe that it's important to maintain the headroom that we have today, uh, keeping in mind that while conditions have improved a great deal, there are still strains in the financial system. Banks are still facing pressures. Uh, but let me go back and say that we are carefully analyzing uh, Chairman Frank's uh, proposals, and uh, we will be uh, coming back to Chairman Frank uh, with our thoughts. Do you have any initial concerns with, you know, legislation that draws out of that fund for 
uh, purposes other than what was authorized in the e, e, uh, I think we need to have more conversations about exactly what form that would take before I could draw a conclusion. Yeah, it really sounds to me like y'all have not taken any hard approach that you're not going to reach into that fund for all sorts of new ideas. I, I would uh, not presume at this point to speak on whether we might or might not uh, uh, be funding some okay. of those initiatives out of the TARP sure. funds. Would, and, would, but we are considering it very carefully. Sure. Would you have conversations with uh, the uh, minority as you move forward to? Let me say, uh, Congressman, that uh, I look forward to meeting with each member of the committee, and I'd be glad to discuss and respond to any questions or suggestions that you may have for us. Uh, let me have one last quick question. Uh, Rahm Emanuel uh, has said that the uh, Obama administration has rescued the economy. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? I would say that the, uh, that the ESA law has played a very important role in improving the uh, financial markets and the soundness of the financial industry in the United States, which has already had measurable benefits for the American public. Sure, and I, I do agree that the act that was passed last September has had benefits. I, I associate with myself. I'm not sure that we can pronounce victory. Uh, a former president did that in a, in a foreign policy matter, and it came back to bite him. So. As this president has said, uh, we, it's going to take time to heal this economy and to heal the financial system. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Spear, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Allison, for joining us this afternoon. I have been listening to the discussion, um, although I haven't been present in the room, but I do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the, the Inspector General for SIGTARP was uh, before another committee yesterday, and he was very clear that uh, no one in Treasury has come over to review the surveys that he has received from every one of the banks in terms of how they are using TARP money. And I find that absolutely in, um, unbelievable and irresponsible that one agency of government has been able to access information, has the information, and nobody from Treasury has looked at it. No one from your shop has looked at it. And I want to know why not. Well, thank you for your question, Congresswoman. Um, uh, first, let me uh, compliment uh, 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 the Inspector General Borofsky for his initiative. Uh, I look forward to seeing the information, as do my colleagues. And we'll be happy to meet with him about this. So you're committing to this committee now that you are going to meet with the Inspector General and review the material that he has developed in the survey of 360 banks. I'll be very pleased to meet with him. Great. Um, in his report that he issued yesterday, he said, although Treasury has taken some steps towards improving transpar transparency in TARP programs, it has repeatedly failed to adopt recommendations that SIGTARP believes are essential to providing basic transparency and fulfill Treasury's stated commitment to implement TARP with the highest degree of accountability and transparency possible. Now, one of their recommendations is that the Treasury should require all TARP recipients to report on the actual use of TARP funds. Uh, Treasury has declined saying that reporting would be meaningless. And I got to tell you um, that my constituents probably don't think it's meaningless to know precisely where their taxpayer dollars are going. So my question to you is, will you actually adopt that particular recommendation? Well, first of all, um, we welcome the recommendations of the SIGTARP and the other oversight bodies. As I mentioned earlier in my testimony, uh, we have adopted uh, or, very, or come very close with a few minor details to adopting about three-fourths of the recommendations that we have received. Well, there's there only are, th five. There's only four recommendations here, and he says you haven't adopted any of them. I just want to get a clear answer. Will you or will you not make public how the money that's been received by these banks in TARP have been spent? Yes. 
Let me uh, first of all point out that every month we provide comprehensive information on our website, financialstability.gov, about the actual lending activities of all the banks in which we have invested. With Ms. Mr. Gives, Allison, with all due yes, respect, I'm asking a very simple question, mm -hmm. and I just want a simple answer. Either you're willing to do it or you're not willing to do it. Well, we think that the most important information for the public Either yes is the or no. Activity. Will you do it? We, are, uh, uh, we have looked at that possibility. Our concern, which we have mentioned, is that uh, if we, let me give you some examples. This is a capital purchase program. Its intent is to provide capital to banks. We disclose all those activities. Every capital transaction, whether we invest or whether we receive monies back, is posted on our website within 48 hours. There's voluminous information about that. Once the money has been invested, on a daily basis, the banks may be shifting the use of the funds. They're dynamic institutions. If they report one day the money has been used for this, another day it can be changing. Furthermore, because the money is all placed in a cash account as it's received, and money is fungible, it, while the bank may say that they have let's say, put $50 million Mr. into Mr. Allison, lending. I, yes. I, I hate to interrupt you, but sure, my time please. is very limited, and you've mm -hmm. just used up another two minutes. Um, this is my request to you. Mr. Borowski believes that you can put this on a public place for public uh, distribution. I'm asking you to work with him and find a way by which the taxpayers of this country are going to be able to access this information and know how the banks are spending their money. I want to know, and I, I, I'm really getting tired of many of the people in the administration and frankly some of my colleagues um, in Congress protecting the banks. We should be protecting the taxpayers, and the taxpayers have every right to know how their TARP money is being spent. The gentlelady's time is up, and uh, the next person we recognize as Congressman McHenry for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Allison. Um, I think to my colleague's point here, um, you know, money is obviously fungible, right? So it would be very difficult for you to say that it's the $100 billion or $1 billion that this institution got that they lent here the whole deal. That's fair to say. Is that yes, correct? Sir. Okay. Um, now, the point that I think many of us have is we're concerned about what's happening on Main Street, you know, how that money is actually being lent. So to get more precisely at, at my colleague's question, are you able to track, uh, track lending standards for these various institutions? Uh, while we post the actual information on lending by all those banks, which we think is very important for the public to know. Uh, we are not the regulator for those banks. We don't oversee the bank's lending standards. Our role has been, under the ESA law, to provide capital to promote the stability of those banks, not to manage the banks and not to regulate the banks. The regulation is, is I mean, handled by other regulatory agencies. Obviously, but in terms of disclosure and tracking those lending standards, are you doing that? We are not tracking the individual lending standards of each bank. Okay. Uh, I, I assume that the regulators are very much involved in monitoring the lending standards uh, of yes, each of these banks. Yes, but we have you before the, 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 the yes, Congress sir. about yes, TARP funds and TARP right. funds That's right. which are then being lent out or not being lent out. And the SIGTARP report uh, says that obviously this can be done to track lending standards. And uh, so we'll get to that in the next panel. With that, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to uh, my colleague from New York, Mr. Lee. It's very kind of you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Just a, a quick question. It, it, and it gets back to, and I've got to tell you, the, the, the taxpayers in my district are, are very frustrated with the, what we are doing in Washington and, and the concern over the, the debt that we have in this country. Now, at the end of this year, the projections are being close to $2 trillion. And understandably, I think it is very positive news in the fact that we have, I believe you mentioned, somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 billion being paid back. But overwhelmingly, I hear from my constituents that the need that we need to start paying down this, this debt rather than it, it sounds like what I heard from you today is that 
we just plan on keeping this program going on in perpetuity, or at least over the next five years. So dollars come back are being potentially re-injected into the market and potentially going to places outside what their original purposes were stated or the potential to do so. Is that a fair statement? Uh, let me make clear, uh, Congressman, and thank you for that. It gives me an opportunity to clarify that, that concern. Um, under the ESO law, uh, the Treasury would no longer make investments in uh, institutions after the end of this year unless the Treasury Secretary makes a determination that it is in the interests of the economy and of the nation to extend this program until October of 2010. That's what the law, this is not an open-ended, unending uh, investment program. And in the investments themselves, there are built-in incentives to pay back the money. The cost of the funds in many of these programs rises over time. In some, the program itself expires over a period of time. So we are very mindful of the need to protect the taxpayer's interest to get the highest possible return we can to be careful stewards of the money. And we also understand that this program, uh, in terms of making investments, uh, will uh, terminate at some point in the not too distant future. Nonetheless, the government may still hold investments for a longer period of time. And we are preparing for that eventuality to make sure we continue to have the procedures, the policies, and the personnel to be uh, responsibly overseeing those investments. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back my... Uh... Thank you, and the chair now recognizes Mr. Grayson for five minutes. Thank you. And I will remind uh, everybody in the room that votes are about to be called, so we'll probably go another five to seven minutes after votes are called and then recess the hearing and come back after votes are concluded. You recognize, sir? Thank you. Uh, on page three of your statement, Mr. Allison, you say, we have provided capital to 657 institutions across 48 states, including over 300 small and community banks, enabling banks to absorb losses from bad assets while continuing to lend to consumers and businesses, we continue to invest in banks every week. In terms of that statement, Mr. Allison, I, I think of this myself as um, a distinction between good banks and bad banks. Good banks are banks that have been profitable, have remained profitable through uh, the economic uh, disaster that we've experienced the past year and a half, uh, are well managed, can assess risk properly, and they're fundamentally different from the bad banks the bad banks have basically taken bets, often with taxpayer-provided money, government-provided money. Uh, they made bad decisions, and unfortunately for all of us, many of the people at those banks are still in charge of those banks, making more bad decisions every day. Now, it seems to me that if you provide a dollar worth of capital to a good bank, that bank might be able to make $10 worth of loans. Mm -hmm. That's the fractional reserve system that we live under. If you provide a dollar's worth of capital to a bad bank, that bank certainly is not going to be able to do any more than provide $10 worth of loans. It also will try to cover its losses, maybe pay out more money to its bad management, maybe pay out money to its shareholders, and not do what we're trying to do through this program. So why is it that we do something like enable banks to absorb losses from bad assets in this program? Yes, why don't we invest in the good banks, not the bad banks? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, we are investing in banks that are deemed to be viable <coughs> by the regulators. And banks voluntarily come to us, but they must be deemed to be viable banks. Now, some viable banks have bad assets, but those viable banks are still very important to their communities. And so as part of the financial stability effort, uh, we're helping banks uh, to recover, stabilize, so that they can continue lending in their communities to businesses, large and small, and to individuals to keep the economy going. Well, following this line of questions, wouldn't we be better off if we gave the same amount of money to good banks, banks that were functioning well, so that they could expand their operations and make more loans rather than propping up bad banks that have made mistakes that have cost all uh, of us? Congressman, these are viewed as good banks with some bad assets and uh, as banks that can be viable and ongoing and continue to serve their communities. How do we get to a point where a good bank has a bad asset? I mean, seriously, doesn't that reflect some really bad choices on the part of the management of that bank whenever they have a bad asset? Well, I think that uh, virtually every bank 
has some bad loans on his books. And uh, what we've seen is because uh, uh, prices of real estate have declined so much, commercial as well as residential, a number of companies have had to go out of business because of declining economic activity. Loans that seemed to be quite good when they were granted turn out to be not so good in an extreme environment like today. And yet we have had banks that make the right decision. Are you familiar with the concept of moral hazard? Yes, sir. Aren't we inviting serious moral hazard by continuing in this way to prop up bad banks rather than helping good banks expand their operations and letting capitalism work? Well, sir, we have to keep in mind that uh, these banks have to pay us back. And we've been well paid back just today by one of them. And uh, we're working, uh, w making every effort to make sure that the taxpayers who made these investments uh, uh, obtain an appropriate return. That's our responsibility, to work on their behalf. At the same time, these funds are going to help stabilize not just the banking system, but the economy, which benefits all Americans. And we have seen that the banking condition has improved. We've seen that uh, uh, home sales are starting to stabilize in many parts of the country. The risk of the financial system has declined, which is good for everybody. And uh, we're hopeful that by continuing to provide the support as the banks need it, uh, that we're going to be have a strong underpinning to begin this recovery that we're all so anxious to see. But resources are always limited, even for the federal government. Yes, Wouldn't we be able to accomplish all of that and more if we directed our support to good banks rather than to propping up bad banks? Well, again, I, I believe that many of these uh, were good banks that uh, were uh, active in lending in their communities, and we're now seeing a financial situation that this country hasn't experienced since at least the 1930s. This has been an extremely serious uh, uh, decline in, in asset values that's affected every American. We have to keep the economy going. The whole purpose of this program, as enacted by Congress last year, was to inject capital into the banking system uh, so it could uh, not only survive, but stabilize as soon as possible. I see my time is up, but I would urge you, uh, Mr. Allison, to give some thought to this subject. If you are continuing to invest in banks every week, give some thought to investing in the good banks, not the bad ones. Thank you for your advice. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. You're recognized, sir, for, um, for, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Allison, you mentioned in your testimony um, that you could not comment on some of the existing negotiations and discussions you're having with some of the banks, given that they're trying to buy back some of the warrants that they have that are outstanding. And yes, sir. I've had some questions come back from some of these folks that I've interacted with about other different set of rules, et cetera, that apply to them. But you also mentioned in your testimony that if Treasury and these firms or these banks cannot agree on a fair market value for these warrants, that the warrants would be sold then by Treasury on a public auction, correct? Yes, sir. Is there a timeline on that public auction of when that would be? Is there a time frame that would be put in place when the auction would actually take place? Are there guidelines? Are there stipulations yes, that you can share a little bit more about? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. We're actually working hard on those guidelines now. Uh, they're not yet completed. Uh, at, at when they are, uh, we will uh, uh, provide more information. We want this to be as transparent a process as possible, but we've had to give very careful thought since this amendment to the Act was put into place on how we might best do this in a way that protects the interests of uh, taxpayers. Okay, and just knowing that it's in the interest of protecting taxpayers, as you said, and repaying and kind of re-unwinding all of this that has taken place, right. um, you don't foresee this is going to be like another year or? No, sir. Okay. That's no, sir. Just kind of curious on that. I also want to mention, too, um, you know, is, from your estimation, all the work you've done on this issue, do you think that the TARP funds have been equitably reaching the smaller financial institutions? Well, most of the institutions that have received TARP funds are small. And we have uh, at least 300 uh, uh, quite small and community uh, banks and other uh, small institutions who have received these funds. Nonetheless, we are concerned about uh, making sure that uh, small banks, which are so vital to their local communities and account for an outsized portion of small business lending, are able to continue lending. So that's why we reopened the CPP program in May, I think it was, to uh, make it possible for uh, these banks to, if they needed, uh, tap into the CPP facility. And we've had a number. We have a number every week who are coming to us uh, for, uh, for that funding and giving us their preferred stock. 
we're also looking at other ways of assisting small business. And we may have some announcements to make about that before long. And this was a question I was going to ask also for the next panel, but it seems I'm, at least I'm hearing differently uh, from some of the smaller financial institutions about their inaccessibility of uh, some of the opportunities uh, for these funds. And I'm just curious if you might have a perspective on why I might be hearing uh, that perspective from some uh, of these folks. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to know the names of those banks. Okay. Congressman, if you can provide them to us, we'll get in touch with those banks as soon as possible. Uh, they also should be talking with their regulator. We. Uh, we make investments on the recommendation of the bank's regulator. So the first stop should be the regulator. And uh, then we will consider the investment. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Margin, Texas, you recognize for five minutes, sir? Thank you, sir. Could you do just uh, real quickly discuss the concept of headroom that you were talking about earlier? Uh, you've got a $700 million basically cap on the amount of money that you can put out at any given time. Yes, sir. So at n now that we're pretty far into this program, you also mm -hmm. have an inflow of money. Yes, sir. So you have kind of a revolving fund. So if you... Uh, is it public how much the uh, Goldman Sachs transaction was worth today? Uh, let me uh, make clear that um, uh, when money is repaid to us, it's put in the general account of the U.S. Treasury. Okay. And uh, so the headroom is the difference between the amount that we have budgeted and, uh, uh, and the amount that, uh, of, of the total uh, limit, which is $700 billion, plus the amount that's been repaid. So we have budgeted totally about $643 billion, but we've also repaid money. And when you add the repayments to the difference between the 643 and the 700 mm -hmm. billion, you end up with about 128 billion dollars of what we call headroom, which we think is important to have at this point uh, in this economic crisis, in case uh, banks find that uh, they need additional funding in order to uh, maintain their activities and preserve their financial strength. But uh, when you define budget, you mean that those are funds that you've already committed that have the, not been dispersed? These are funds that we have, have uh, uh, allocated uh, and we may use for certain purposes. Let me point out that at that uh, at this moment, uh, we have uh, invested about $360 billion. Okay. But the, and so the difference between the 360 and the 643, I believe it is, well, when is, you say is, what, is what we, we have more or less earmarked for additional uses. So when you necessary. say allocated, it may be a, an asset type allocation, but on, not a specific obligation to fund a bank. Uh, as far as the CPP program goes, that is correct. Yes, sir. So if, the, if Congress reauthorizes the extension uh, to October t 2010, is that correct? Well, it would be the Treasury Secretary who has the authority to extend the program until October 2010. So if, if the Treasury Secretary authorizes the extension to 2010, yes, sir. then you, this, this whole dynamic process of of headroom and inflow and outflow remains the same. I mean, you've got that, you've got that pretty well fixed in, in the way you're going to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, then 2010, is there a possibility to extend beyond that on the part of the secretary, or is that a, would that be a congressional act? Uh, I believe that uh, the uh, the Treasury's authority, uh, the Tre secretary of the Treasury's authority, extends through. 2010 to extend that. And uh -oh. then, and that's to disperse, and then yes, the repayment follows the that. The repayments could continue for some time. And, and we're the still repayment, be, and yes, then, but then there's no, there's no longer any outflow. It all, is all inflow at that point. Uh, that's my understanding of how it works, yes, sir. And as far as, what if you ended up with a situation where you had in excess of the 700 because of the repayment of the TARP and the sale of the warrants and the redemption of the preferred and the interest paid. Do you mean uh, we would not be above 700 billion, we'd be well below it? 
You, you, you've already forecasted that you, there, you th th There's a limit on the amount we can have outstanding at any one time invested on behalf of the public. That's $700 billion. So the we, money we, basically. We may not exceed that number. So it goes into the tre Treasury yes, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the general fund. Yes, sir. But we've already raised the debt ceiling ah. to include that, al that, that appropriation, correct? Uh, sir, uh, you're getting beyond my expertise. Well, I mean, is there, a the is, is there a snapback provision in, in the bill yes. that says as the money comes back into the Treasury, then the money is paid, paid down on the debt? Or uh, do we not already have uh, through the right by raising the, yes. the, uh, the budget, yes. isn't the money really I, captured in, I, the, in the federal government yes. uh, coffers? I, I will get back to you on that, but it's my understanding that as the money comes in, that reduces the national debt as it comes in. Okay. But let me, let me give you a more definitive answer on that as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and I would uh, at this time thank you, Mr. Allison, for your testimony. You are excused. I invite the second panel to sit down. We have just a very few minutes, I think, before votes are called. We'll go as long as we can. All right. We'll go and five Mr. Chairman. to seven minutes. I'd just like to introduce into the record the uh, Special Inspector General's report uh, on the bank's use of money, uh, which does show that 83 percent of them uh, told the SIG that they were, had used it for lending. Even the 4 percent that they said they did they it had or had not money. used it for lending. Huh? They had or had not used it. Had. Oh. So, I mean, it, it does, I think, um, indicate at least some evidence of that the, the U.S. banks are using the TARP funds uh, to increase lending. Some of them did it to, to maintain their capital levels and stay in business to yes. keep the doors open. So, Without objection, it will be received into the record. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Allison. At this time, thank uh, you, Mr. Excuse, Chairman. I invite the second panel to uh, be seated. I'm pleased to introduce our second panel of witnesses for this afternoon's hearing. For this panel, we'll start with and welcome back Mr. Neil Borofsky, the Special Inspector General of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, better known as SIGTARP. And next, we're glad to have with us again Professor Elizabeth Warren, Chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel. And finally, we'll hear testimony from uh, Mr. Tom McCool, Director of the Center for Economics at the, at the Government Accountability Office. Thank you all for being here. And without objection, your written statements will be made a part of the record. You'll each be recognized, and I think votes are just now being called. I think we can again take the first witness. You'll be each recognized for a five-minute statement summarizing your written testimony. Inspector General Borofsky, you're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is, uh, it's an honor to be back before this committee. Thank you. Um, it is also an honor to be sitting next to uh, two of uh, our most important oversight partners, uh, of course, Professor Warren from the Congressional Oversight Panel and Mr. McCool from, from GAO. Um, this week, we, we've introduced and presented our, our most recent quarterly report and the oversight that we've been conducting over the past quarter. Uh, and so much of that oversight is uh, a result of the coordination that we've had uh, with our oversight partners. And one of the things we strive for, for of course, is to coordinate the oversight. The TARP has gone from a, uh, a $700 billion program, which is large enough in, in its own right, to now being expanded with, with uh, activity with the Federal Reserve and the FDIC into a almost $3 trillion program, and this is more than any, any one of the three of us and our organizations could ever cover alone. Uh, and we've strived to coordinate that oversight, working with GAO, uh, our important audit partner, trying to cover as much of this terrain as possible, and we recently are, are putting forward a, a joint audit project, our, our first on corporate governance, um, utilizing the, the experience and activity of both of our agencies. And we've recently, uh, this month, did a coordinated project with uh, Professor Warren and the Congressional Oversight Panel. Uh, the first part was, was their, I thought, their excellent valuation report and their July report and the conclusions there. We're going to be using that as context for an audit that we've launched into the warrant repurchase process. Um, basically, in our report that we've, that we've just uh, delivered this week, um, I'll just very briefly describe uh, what, what's contained in there. In Section 2 of the report, we do a brief overview of what's happened in the last three months in the TARP. And there's been a lot of activity from the bankruptcy of the auto companies, from repurchase of more than $70 billion of capital per in the capital purchase program, from the selection of the nine asset managers, and the commitment of approximately $30 billion of taxpayer money in the public-private investment program. 
In Section 3 of our report, we attempt to put that in context by giving detail surrounding the approximately 50 other programs. You know, so often a particular TARP recipient not only accesses the TARP, but will access other parts of the financial bailout from the government, whether it's a loan guarantee from the FDIC or borrowing money from the Federal Reserve. And what we've attempted to do in our report is bring transparency to that by setting out approximately 50 of the programs, most significant programs that have been implemented uh, or discussed and described since the onset of this crisis. Um, in Section 5 of our report, we give our recommendations. Um, we go over our past recommendations and have issued several new recommendations. One of them, which was discussed with Mr. Allison, uh, was the, uh, our continued recommendation that Treasury require TARP recipients to, to provide information on their use of funds. As was also discussed, we recently uh, finished our audit, which was completed and uh, made public this Monday. And we've demonstrated that notwithstanding the inherent fungibility of money, banks can and should be required to report on the use of funds. Uh, contrary to Mr. Allison's suggestions, we've demonstrated that this is a meaningful task. Uh, when we asked the banks what they did with the money, they were able to tell us. And they were able to tell some of the things that uh, Ranking Member Ruckus, you, that you, you described just moments ago, that, that they were able to explain how they were able to increase lending or at least stop the hemorrhaging, uh, avoid further reduction of lending. Banks told us that they would have come to a standstill if not for, for these funds. But they were also able to explain other uses of funds, how they invest in money, how they were able to maintain capital cushions so they could withstand future losses. This is vitally important data from our perspective and vitally important transparency. I understand the orthodoxy and the, the concept of capital accounts. And I understand that perhaps that is why Treasury initially was so reluctant to adopt our recommendation. But now that we have the proof, now that banks, when asked, the banks themselves have said, we can report on how we're using the funds, we believe that these excuses and explanations for lack of transparency um, should no longer be countenanced. And we believe that Treasury should, and, and in order to meet its promised goals of bringing transparency to this program, must adopt this recommendation. We also make other recommendations in the report relating to other aspects of transparency, including the public-private investment program, uh, as well as some other transparency recommendations that have been kicking around for some months, including the basic one that Treasury report to the American people what the value is of their investment. Treasury receives monthly reports um, from its asset managers with estimates of what the value of the TARP portfolio is, and we believe basic transparency would require uh, Treasury to make that information public. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Borofsky. And uh, we votes have been called. There's uh, 10 minutes left for votes. We can hear one more witness, and Professor Warren will ask you to do a five-minute presentation or less so we can get over and vote. And then we will reconvene and, and have hear from Mr. McCool and then have questions of the witnesses afterwards. Yeah. Thank Actually, you. Mr. Chairman, we probably got, if she takes even six minutes, I think we're in good shape. All right. so, uh, Very good. I thank think you. you know how fast I talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairman Moore. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, it is an honor to be here uh, again today in front of this uh, committee. I appreciate your inviting us. I, I want to say, as I always do, unlike the gentleman to my left and right, I am part of a panel, and so when I'm here, I'm not scripted, which means I speak for myself. I will do my best to represent my panel, but I represent only my views when I open my mouth. Our job is to review the current state of financial markets and the financial regulatory system and to report to Congress every 30 days. Uh, so far, we have delivered to you eight oversight reports and two special reports on regulatory reform and on farm credit, both of which were also required by law. We have also had nine hearings. We've been out in the field on your behalf. We will have our 10th hearing next Monday in Detroit. Um, our contribution, again, our statutory mandate, is a fact-based analysis designed to raise issues about the operation and direction of TARP and about the broader effort to restore stability to the economic system. We call that asking whether or not TARP uh, is operating to benefit the American family and the American economy. We hit three repeating themes, and that is the need for transparency, the need for accountability, and the need for clearly articulated programs by Treasury. We coordinate closely with the GAO and Special Inspector General, Mr. Borofsky, just identified our coordinated effort 
uh, which we were very pleased to participate in, and that is a, an important part of the report we just issued on warrant valuation. Uh, Member Bacchus uh, identified the key to what the warrants are about. We understood what the risks were when uh, Congress allocated the potential $700 billion to TARP. This is the American taxpayer's one opportunity to participate in the upside. Our statutory mandate is to look at the choices Treasury is making, and that really involves not just our July report, but also our June report. Our June report was on uh, stress tests, the question about repayment in the first instance and whether the stress tests were stressful enough. We then moved to our July report once the decision is made to take money back from these financial institutions, what should be the pricing on the warrants. Um, in order to do the warrant valuation, we thought it would be helpful in terms of oversight to do an independent valuation, uh, to ask how it is that others might value this, our own expertise within the panel, but also we were aided by uh, Nobel laureate uh, Robert Merton, Professor Daniel Bergstrasser, and Professor Victoria Ivashina. All are from the Harvard Business School all advised us independently without consulting with each other. Uh, and they helped us review our model. They helped us review our inputs. Ultimately, we did all of the calculations internally to the panel. And that's how we came up with the numbers we came up with. Now, our finding was that the price paid in the first warrants that were sold were about 66% of what our valuation would show was the current market value. Uh, if Treasury, got only 66% of current valuation uh, as it went forward, that would be a loss to the American taxpayer of about $2.7 billion. Now, we are very careful in this report to point out some key features. The first is only a tiny proportion of these warrants have been sold, and they are in very small banks in the first sales. We acknowledge there may be uh, differences about what are the appropriate liquidity discounts to put into the valuation. We also acknowledge that there may be considerations other than maximizing the return to the taxpayer. Uh, for example, trying to get out of this uh, business of holding warrants as quickly as possible, and those could affect the valuation. I will say, however, that since we issued our report 12 days ago, uh, Chase has decided it wants to go to auction. Goldman Sachs has just struck a deal today, which adjusted for the rise in uh, the value of their stock prices over the last 12 days is almost precisely at our estimated valuation. And I heard Treasury announce in this hearing that they will be revealing more information about their uh, negotiations over stock price warrants. I think that means oversight works. Um, so I am pleased to be here today uh, to uh, uh, give you our report to answer your questions in any way that we can, and to talk about alternative approaches to valuing these warrants. I, again, appreciate the invitation to be here, and I'm glad to take your questions. Thank and you. thank you for your testimony. Uh, Professor Warren, uh, we are going to stand in recess until after votes, and I would ask uh, members to come back immediately after votes so we can reconvene this hearing, and we'll finish up uh, with the testimony of Mr. McCool, and then have questions by the uh, members. Thank you, and I apologize for this uh, interruption of our hearing, but we do have to vote. Thank you very much. We'll see you all in a little bit. Hearing or reconvene. I uh, thank you for the witnesses for staying around and uh, for the hearing. And we got back here just as quickly as we could. Um, Mr. McCool, you're recognized, sir, for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Moore, Ranking Member Brigitte, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our work on the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Uh, the economic, I'm sorry, the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act that authorized TARP requires GAO to report at least every 60 days on findings resulting from our oversight of the status of actions taken under the program. 
My statement today is based on our fifth mandated report issued on June 17th, which follows up on our previous recommendations and covers the actions taken as part of TARP through June 12, 2009. Our oversight work under the Act is ongoing, and our next report will be issued in the next few days and will focus on TARP's loan modification program. Specifically, this st my statement today focuses on the nature and purposes of activities that have been initiated under TARP, including repurchases of preferred shares and warrants, and Treasury's efforts to establish a management structure for TARP. As of July 10, 2009, Treasury had dispersed about $361 billion of the roughly $700 billion in TARP funds. Most of the funds, $204 billion, went to purchase preferred shares and subordinated ventures from over, of over 650 financial institutions under the Capital Purchase Program. This program continues to be Office of Financial Stability's primary vehicle for stabilizing financial markets. At the same time, the Treasury continues to purchase preferred, sh preferred shares in institutions. Other institutions have paid over $70 billion to repurchase shares. As of July 10th, 12 of the 33 financial institutions that repurchased their preferred shares from Treasury had also repurchased their warrants, and three others had repurchased their warrant preferred stock from Treasury at an aggregate uh, return of about $80 million. Although the Office of Financial Stability and its regulators have established criteria for accepting and approving CPP applications, the regulators' criteria for determining when institutions can repurchase preferred stock from Treasury lack adequate transparency. This is an area in which we made a recommendation in our report for the Treasury in coordination with the primary regulators to ensure consistent criteria in the consideration of repurchases. While Treasury has provided some limited information about the warrant valuation process, it is yet to provide the level of transparency at the transaction level that would address questions about whether the Department is getting the best price for taxpayers. This is another area in which we recommend that Treasury provide such transparency in the process by publicly disclosing more detailed information about warrant prices. I was pleased to hear Mr. Allison suggest earlier that Treasury seems to be moving forward in that effort. Although it is unclear whether any institutions will choose to participate in the capital assistance plan, the Federal Reserve did conduct stress tests of the largest 19 bank holding companies to see how well they would withstand uh, a more arduous than expected economic conditions. While the Federal Reserve disclosed the stress test results, it had no plans to disclose information about the institutions going forward. What information, if any, is disclosed will be left to the discretion of the affected institutions, raising a number of concerns, including that the institutions could disclose inconsistent or only <coughs> selected information. Moreover, the Federal Reserve had not developed a mechanism to share information with the Office of Financial Stability about the ongoing condition of the bank holding companies that continue to participate in TARP programs. For this reason, we made a recommendation to the Federal Reserve to disclose to the public information on the companies against the more adver sorry, adverse scenario on a going forward basis. While the Office of Financial Stability has made progress in establishing its management infrastructure, continued attention to hiring remains important, especially within the uh, Office of the Chief Risk and Compliance Officer and the Home Ownership uh, Group. Those are areas where their, their hiring has not been up to their to, to what they themselves say are their requ requirements. They still have a number of vacancies and they need to fill them as rapidly as they can. Treasury has also continued to build the network of contractors and financial agents to support TARP administration and operations that have been key to OFS's efforts to develop and administer the TARP programs. Treasury has provided information to the public on procurement contracts and financial agency agreements but has not included a breakdown of cost data by each entity. As a result, Treasury has missed an opportunity to provide additional transparency to its TARP operations. And that's another area in which we made a recommendation to Treasury to improve transparency. Mr. Chairman, uh, this Ranking Member Biggert, that concludes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. McCool. Uh, at this time, I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, Professor Warren, once people have had a chance to analyze the transaction, do you have any sense that $1.1 billion paid by Goldman Sachs will be enough for taxpayers? Do you think we could have received more if Goldman went through a public auction? Are there other policy issues that should be considered? I, I think that, uh, thank you, Chairman, I think it's a good question. Uh, using the valuation metrics that we laid out in our report, uh, the Goldman price comes in almost precisely at what we had recommended. Uh, I believe the Goldman price is $1.1 billion, mm -hmm. and using our valuation, uh, it would have been $1.08 mm -hmm. 
billion. So we're, we're within rounding error on that. And that certainly increases our confidence uh, that uh, uh, Treasury is using a, uh, uh, a strong valuation approach here. I, I do want to say, though, that there are these other issues that, that uh, lurk in the, in the sales process. And it's hard to find a substitute for the benefit of a public sale. A uh, public sale reassures everyone that this is the market price. Um, but I, I certainly understand Congressman Baucus's point. There are, there are times when we decide that we don't want to delay, that we want to be able to move faster. These are costs and benefits and ultimately policy choices, not just for Treasury, but for Congress to weigh in on. We think as your oversight panel, the best we can do is outline it. We can give you this independent valuation as we've done and put the factors in front of you, which we've tried to do. Thank you. Mr. Borofsky, do you have any different thoughts about that or do you agree with what Professor Warren said? I, I definitely <clears throat> defer to Professor Warren. Uh, her report and her study I think was, was comprehensive. I thought it was very instructive. Uh, we haven't done a, a similar effort. Uh, we're, we, we do have an ongoing audit that will address different issues, but uh, I, I would certainly defer to uh, Professor Warren and the panel on this. Okay. Mr. Borofsky, another question. I noticed that in addition to your quarterly reports you issued this week, you also concluded the use of funds, quote, use of funds audit that you conducted. What did you learn from that audit and what steps should Treasury take to increase accountability in the TARP program? And uh, I want to ask you that, sir. I think the most important thing we learned is I think we've definitively proved that despite the inherent fungibility of money, banks can, when asked, report on how they're using their funds and that they can provide a great degree of transparency and answer that question. We saw that banks did, although Treasury, as Mr. Allison noticed, noted, um, does provide lending snapshots of each month, that's not the only thing that banks do with their TARP funds. According to the banks themselves, they use it to maintain capital cushions, uh, insurance for a rainy day for, for future losses. They use it to acquire other financial institutions. Um, they use it to invest in securities. You know, all sorts of different things that that our, our survey helped provide a necessary level of transparency, but it's only part of, you know, our, our survey was a snapshot as of February. We don't have the resources to do this on a regular basis, and our survey was voluntary. So my recommendation is that Treasury finally adopt our recommendation, require financial institutions who are receiving TARP funds to report on a periodic basis on how they're using the money. Thank you. And Professor Warren, did you find any connections or parallels with the SIGTARP's use of funds audit and what C uh, COP learned when reviewing the lending practices and how it affects American families and small businesses? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, we did. In our field hearings and our earlier reports, we have um, documented uh, the constriction in small business lending and the inadequacy of the tools that have been used thus far by Treasury to try to stimulate uh, small business lending. Uh, we think this is entirely consistent, what we have found and reported on with what it is that Mr. Borofsky has found and reported on through a different mechanism. Uh, my time is up, and at this time I'll yield uh, to, to questions from Mrs. Bigger, please, the ranking chair. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Borofsky, um, in, in talking about the the, um, the audit of the of the warrant and evaluation and sales, wh when can we expect to see this audit? You know, we're we're basically evaluating the timing. When we first launched the audit, it was it was unclear when sort of the the, the larger institutions were going mm -hmm. to be either repurchasing or or going through the auction process. Now that we're seeing some of these repurchases, I think we want to take a look and see what the the auction process mm -hmm. for it to be the most useful audit. I think we'd like to see that process be used before we, we project a, a, an end date. Okay. And uh, can you ensure that the, the audit will not compromise uh, the Treasury's de Department to uh, negotiate uh, the best possible price for taxpayers? Do you think there's any uh, chance of that happening if, if the audit is out and they're negotiating? With everything that we do, including this and any of our audits and really with our recommendations, uh, it's inherent upon us. I think it's a very important for us to take into consideration the, the point that you just raised. And we would never uh, make a disclosure midway through a negotiation, anything that could possibly uh, impact in a negative way on, on the taxpayer's return. 
Our job is to protect the taxpayer's interest, and we're very, very sensitive to these types of issues and, and protecting confidential information uh, to the extent it may impact or, or be a detriment to the taxpayer. Thank you. Then, uh, Professor Warren, the uh, July uh, report issued by uh, COP states that the best manner to sell these warrants is on the open market. However, uh, and as my colleague, Mr. Henserling, uh, stated in his additional views to that report, uh, choosing a one-size-fits-all method does not seem to be the most appropriate uh, method to value these warrants, um, given that each repurchase uh, negotiation will have different circumstances. Uh, don't we need flexibility in the process to help determine the best value while getting the taxpayers out, out of the business of owning bank stocks or warrants? Uh, Congresswoman, I actually think the report says exactly that, that there should be flexibility. We talk about the advantages uh, to an open market process, but we acknowledge that there are circumstances that may differ. And um, uh, I assume that is part of the reason that Congressman Henserling <coughs> voted for that report. We, we had a 5-0 vote on the valuation yeah. report. But the additional, there's always additional views. Yes. That, uh, in which I think it. he cited right. the report extensively. Right. Do you, um, in, in determining like fair market value, do you use, uh, you know, financial models or is it just the one size fits all? I mean like Black Shoals or is that, do you take that into consideration? Uh, of course. Uh, actually our, our financial models are laid out in, in many, many pages. Mm -hmm in our report, and as I said in my, my testimony, they were independently reviewed, uh, the models were independently reviewed by uh, three highly renowned specialists in modeling, all from the Harvard Business School. Okay, uh, and three members of the, of the panel, uh, Representative Henserling and I think Senator Sununu and uh, uh, Richard Neiman voiced uh, their support for the administration's uh, and Treasury's stated objective to, to exit uh, warrant holdings as soon as, as practical after banks uh, repay the preferred stock. Uh, it didn't seem like this point was at stress at all in the July report. Well, I, th I think that it's, it's like so many things. It depends on the cost. Um, it, there, are, there is always a judgment to be made and exiting in the fastest possible way in return for getting the lowest cost for the taxpayer may not be uh, uh, ultimately beneficial. On the other hand, I certainly understand the point about not hanging on to the warrants for 10 years and the political as well as economic implications of that. So I think the, the main point in the report was that there are advantages and disadvantages uh, to speed uh, and to going to the market in order to try to sell these warrants. <coughs> Ultimately, though, uh, we did emphasize the point that when there is a market-based auction, no taxpayer needs to wonder what happened behind closed doors yeah. or whether the appropriate I, I guess price my, was reached. My, uh, point is that it, it seemed like that was the majority and, and it wasn't really stressed in the, in the report what they said. And, and next, the, the uh, panel's press release for the July report contained uh, the headline, so far Treasury has sold warrants back at 66 percent of panel's best estimate of fair market value. And I, I think that the headline kind of uh, seemed misleading since the, the banks have all redeemed their warrants. Uh, the banks that have redeemed their warrants represent less than 1 percent of the value of all the warrants outstanding. It sounded like there were 66 percent. Actually, I believe the press release makes exactly that point, but let's keep in mind that when that press release was issued, the immediate response was that Chase said, we'll go to a public auction. Goldman, 11 days later, said, uh, we'll sell at the panel's recommended price, and Treasury said we will release more information about our sales process. If the consequence of this report is to encourage those sorts of responses, then I'm, I'm very happy about that report. Yield back. Thank you. And uh, Chair will next recognize Congresswoman Jackie Spear, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank each of you as being true public servants and incredible guardians of the American taxpayers. Having said that, I, I find this discussion very interesting because on the one hand, some of my colleagues um, often 
call upon us to think of, about small businesses and lending to small businesses and the fact that we haven't had enough lending to small businesses and yet we can't seem to get access to information from the banks as to whether or not they are lending to small businesses and wouldn't we want to know that and isn't that what our job is really all about now I think we've got to be very practical here this is an arm's length transaction that goes on between these financial institutions and the US government and these warrants have value now I think timing has everything to do with our success at maximizing the amount of money we get back for the taxpayers. And it's very clear to me that there are some of these uh, arrangements that aren't going to be profitable. AIG comes to mind as, as one in, in particular. So it's important to us, I think, to maximize profits to compensate for the ones that are, are clearly going to be underwater forever. And I'm hoping that as you continue to evaluate, if you believe that we should be holding these assets, these warrants, that we should hold those. It's an arm's length transaction. If the banks are coming to us now and saying, we, we want you to exercise uh, the, the option on the warrant or, or to redeem the warrant, they're saying that because they know that they're on the road to recovery and it's only going to increase in value. So it behooves us to be smart investors right now and I would like your opinions on whether or not there is something to be gained by holding on to them just because they say they want them redeemed doesn't mean we have to act and redeem them our first and only goal should be at maximizing the profits for the taxpayers your comments congresswoman I think you've put your finger right on the ultimate policy question here if that is the only goal, and that is what, what Treasury should be doing, then Treasury should act like any other investor. And you are exactly right. They should take these to market when it's appropriate to take them to market, when they make the judgment that they would be better off to hold than they should hold. There are those who believe there are alternative considerations. There are those who are deeply concerned about the notion that the federal government holds warrants. We we ultimately believe that is a policy choice. There's a, there's a difference of opinion on which is the right way to go with these warrants. And my, my strong view on this is that we laid this out in our report, and ultimately, Congress should advise Treasury about what it thinks is the right way to go here. I think we do this through this, this hearing process. Um, we want to say that if what they're trying to do is maximize value, we can point out ways that we think that is best accomplished. If they have other considerations, then let me be blunt. Then they should articulate what those alternative considerations are and evaluate how much money is left on the table in order to accommodate them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perofsky? I could not agree with Professor Warren Moore. I think that's, that's precisely right. I think that the report brought transparency to the issue. Uh, decision needs to be made, and, and, and I think the the really strong point that, that Professor Warren makes that I can't agree with more is that you need, need to be upfront in articulating what the policy decision is. Be upfront with the American taxpayer that we think there's good reasons to liquidate these warrants now because for, for whatever the reasons are, for the, for the benefits of the banks, let the financial institutions off the hook, whatever, whatever the justification is, but be upfront and honest about what's happening. So I, I agree with Professor Warren on this. Thank you. Mr. McCool. Again, I would agree as well. I mean, it's, it, it is, there are, there are uh, trade-offs here, and I think that the, as long as you're transparent about the trade-offs, then, then uh, and everybody who should be involved in, in thinking about those trade-offs is, is in the decision-making process, then I think that's the way it should work. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would just like to point out that there, you know, there are people who want to see the TARP fail. They want to be able to say, I told you so. So there are people, I believe, that are going to make us try and take action that are not necessarily in the best interests of the public because they want to be able to say at the end of, the, of um, the, the process that we should never have done it in the first place. So I, I hope that we keep our eye on, on what's most important here, and, and that is the American taxpayer. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for, for her questions and the witnesses for their responses. Now I uh, next recognize the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Bacchus. Thank you. Um, I, think I, I think the theme here could be that oversight worked. I mean, it, it worked very well. Um, 
and I think that's always true of uh, of uh, accountability or transparency. It it uh, it normally has a very positive approach, uh, and I think that one of the confirmations we got today, I think that the panel can be proud of, is is the Goldman, the price. <laughs> It was exactly, you know, as you say, it was actually 20 million more than, than you said, and so that maybe can pay for the panel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, this is a panel that actually is going to end up making the uh, taxpayer some money. And I, th you know, often the consumer or the taxpayer is not at the table, you know, and uh, I think they, they were through this panel. It's interesting, the history is that. It, uh, this was originally a three-page bill without any accountability. Then I think the Congress can take a, a, a bow because we put that in there. We put that accountability in there, uh, which was the board. And I think it worked very well. Um, let's see. Yeah, one thing that we always have to, if we could look in the future and see where the markets and the economy are going, it would be pretty easy to make a call on whether we ought to hold it. Although I personally don't think that the U.S. ought to be sort of investing or speculating in the market, which to a certain extent, you know, if you can get a good fair price, you, you take it. Now, you know, if the market dropped 600 points tomorrow and 300 the next day, I would say hold on to them probably. But I, you know, and that is a policy decision that I think the administration probably will have to make. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be with, there'll be, you know, in 10 years we can probably tell what we should have done. Um, you know, one thing that did strike me, and I, I heard four or five months ago from a banker in Alabama that he went to a seminar in Georgia, and there was a bank there in Georgia wanting to buy any, saying, if you're for sale, we want to buy you. And they were going to do it with their TARP money. So you did have 4% that made acquisitions. You know, it'd be kind of interesting to maybe go back and take a closer look at that. And uh, Mr. Sprovsky, I think they're going to probably tell you the truth because you have a right to prosecute. <laughs> and you have that reputation that you're a very good prosecutor. So I think that, that uh, now, you know, there will be some, I'm sure, in that number that actually were, you know, the FDIC or other people said this is a failing bank and they probably some, I wouldn't assume that that 4% was a bad thing in and of itself. Um, I think the Treasury has to understand what, what we have to understand as a member of Congress, and that's that this is the people's money. So there needs to be accountability. This wasn't, you know, this isn't just a, a private business where you're wanting to know about some proprietary thing. This was money that was that was taxpayer money. So I think that sometimes I think you can't justify, you know, some sorts of getting information, but I think you can here. I think you've done a great job. Let me change gears, and uh, 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 Ms. Professor Warren. Um, I wrote a letter to you on June 24th. I've, I've looked at some of those questions. Some of them, you know, I'm not sure that they're a little harder to interpret. Uh, sometime maybe in August, uh, if you could kind of respond to some of those, I'd appreciate it. But I'm not even going to ask you about them now. But uh, the other thing I just thought would, I'd would show you. Would you accept you, my apology that you don't have a response yet? Well, now, I wish there's too much going on, you, you know, with us in session. You know, you, please been, accept my apology. We, no, we I actually don't even best. think they're due. All right. Because I, I, I don't think uh, I don't think it's sufficient time for you to no. to have responded. Because the questions are really you know they're kind of they're going to take a little time. So, uh, but I just wanted to drag. One thing I wanted to show you, and kind of at some point, you might give me an answer. You know, we're talking about one-page uh, disclosures, and this is actually 15 pages on a card agreement. Now, some of these aren't. You know, they're they're just part of the page, but that's what the law requires right now. Oh, no. So you got you got quite a job <laughs> because that's you're going to have to almost say, you know, well, we're not going to require this anymore, or maybe some of this you're going to decide to put in small print. But it does show you the challenges you face uh, if you get your agency through. So, uh, well, thank you.
Thank you, sir. Next, the chair re recognizes. I usually ask questions. That's a very, uh, very rare for me not to do that. But I, there were no questions because I thought the questions were answered. Thank you. Thank you. Chair next recognizes uh, Congressman Kilroy for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And thanks all of you for your work on uh, helping to look out for the taxpayers' issue and to make sure that the values of transparency and accountability are the values that uh, we don't forget as uh, uh, we move further away from the initial infusions of the TARP money. And each one of you have, uh, in your testimony, emphasized the importance of transparency. Uh, and uh, I, I would certainly agree with you. I certainly think sunshine is a great, uh, great thing to have in the public sector. Um, but I um, also think that um, in, in this instance that transparency can assist the taxpayers in getting maximum value uh, maximum return on the investment that they made. Uh, and I think um, the Congressional Oversight Panel report backs that up. It says Treasury would be more likely to maximize taxpayer returns if it sold the warrants through auctions. The reason is straightforward. An auction would cause the warrants to be allocated to the buyers willing to pay the highest price. And competitive pressures in the bidding process may push bids up. You agree with that that statement, Professor Warren? I do, Congresswoman. Well, I I, um, I certainly do as well, and I think that the the market and public auctions are certainly a a, a, a very valid way for setting a price. Now, we've heard today a lot of talk about um, Goldman and um, the value that was received through the negotiation process with Goldman. But um, not to be uh, too pessimistic or too cynical, the, you know, there are reports today that the initial offer uh, from Goldman uh, was made several weeks ago, and the initial offer was um, $650 million. And that was followed up by a counter offer by Treasury of some $900 million and then followed up sometime after that by the release of Goldman's statements indicating how much money they had made, certainly in part because of the infusion of money the taxpayers gave them. And as Goldman stock prices go up, would you agree that the value of those warrants that the taxpayers were holding would also be going up? Yes. So then it's certainly maybe not surprising that Goldman increased its offer to the taxpayers and offered to pay $1.1 $1 billion for the warrants. You agree with that? Yes. But would you also agree that perhaps if we allowed it to go to market, that others who might see the same uh, reports about Goldman's uh, recent earnings might think that holding Goldman's warrants, uh, which could be used by them to purchase stock over a pretty lengthy period of time, might be to them uh, worth more than $1.1 billion, and they might make a higher offer than that at public auction. That is certainly possible, Congresswoman. So, you know, would you agree that uh, the market has a, a great deal of experience in this issue of, of setting prices and that Treasury has a, also experience in terms of conducting public auction? Yes, Congresswoman. And, and again, going back to all three of you and your statements with respect to maximizing value for the taxpayer and being transparent. and. Would you agree that a public auction uh, would be an excellent way to combine and achieve those two, uh, those two goals, maximizing profits and being transparent? Yes, Congresswoman. Anybody on the panel have a different view, disagree? I, I think in particular it addresses a lot of the transparency concerns and a lot of the allegations that may be made when there is, when it is a, a closed door process. 
And that the, the goal of restoring public confidence in, in the markets and having public confidence in our government officials is an important and worthwhile goal as well, I would think. Yes. Thank you. I, I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. McHenry, Congressman McHenry, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for testifying, and sorry for the length of the day. It's long for all of us. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Mr. Borofsky, I uh, heard from you yesterday in front of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, which I'm a member of. Uh, uh, Ms. Warren, um, in terms of your panel, the Congressional Oversight Panel, uh, what's your budget? Uh, we, uh, I can tell you how much we've spent, but we actually Is don't have Is there a budget allocation? No, we don't have a budget allocation. How much uh, have you spent? We spent $2.7 billion, uh, million, <laughs> sorry. <I'm, laughs> you can tell the world I've been dealing in. Uh, uh, 2.7 million, where did we, that money come from? Is it out of TARP or is it out of no, Treasury? It, it, it comes from, from the Senate and from the House. It comes from you. Okay, how is that allocated? I, I'm, 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 How I'm is sorry, that, uh, basically you just spend whatever you want and send the bill to Congress? I mean, uh, that's what, how is that allocated? Well, we, we go through the process, for example, of hiring and getting your approval. How many people can you hire? Are you authorized to hire? We, we can hire as many as we need. We've okay, hired that's about enough. 20. I, I, I think I, it just shows that we don't have a, there isn't a clear budget. Mr. McCool, no. is, that, is that a fair assessment? There's not been a, 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 an appropriations for this committee? I, I don't really, really know. Congress. Huh, this is quite a challenge. Yes. Uh, Mr. Borofsky? I mean, uh, Congressman, I, we, we've got the TARP to look after. Uh, we haven't looked into the funding for the Congressional Oversight. Okay. Our, our Ms. funding, Ms. I, I certainly could speak on if, you, if you'd like. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Inspector General's office is, is an appropriation, yes. Uh, Ms. McCool, uh, in terms of your panel meetings, uh, I, I'm, are, sorry. Are, I'm sorry, Ms. Warren? I just, I'm sorry, I thought you said Ms. McCool, so I, I lost who you were talking to. I'm sorry. It's late in the day. I don't have much time. So, uh, Ms. Warren. Yes. All right. Is it true you have, you have regular panel meetings? Yes, we do, Congressman. Okay. Are those publicly disclosed? The fact that we have the meetings? Yes, Congressman. No, actually the panel meetings. We have, we have business working meetings that are not public meetings. So you have the panel of how many members? We have a, well, we had a five-member panel yes. since Senator Sununu has resigned. We now have a four-member yes. panel. Okay, so I presume it will be when five you meet members against in Sunu. session uh, for the purposes of transacting business, is that uh, open to the public? We have working meetings that are not open to the public. Okay. Do you have a transcript or minutes of that meeting? Uh, I don't have a transcript or minutes. It has, it has a been transcript by... It is recorded by the Senate uh, recording office, but okay. no, Congressman, I have not seen a transcript. Okay. Um, is a transcript available of your meetings? Publicly? Not uh, so. For members of Congress, is, it, is that available for your meetings? It's not available publicly, no, Congressman. Uh, I'm, not, I'm a member of Congress. Oh, I'm and, sorry. Uh, I'm am, sorry. Am I able to Could get a copy of the transcript of your meetings? I believe our transcripts are held in our office, and if you wanted to send someone would that be over available? to read them, I believe you would be able to read them. Okay. If you wish to do that, Congressman. Uh, so you'll make that available for members. If you if you wish to come to our offices and okay. read it, we would. Okay. Uh, would would, uh, why are the transcripts not available to the public? There, these are working meetings of the panel, and we discuss a great deal of confidential information. And so they were never public from the beginning. We do hold, I should remind you, Congressman, we do hold public hearings. Is this an executive session, which you have these, this is what's interesting to me. You're an oversight panel, yes. yet you don't disclose your meetings. And, and what happens and what transpires in these meetings and the decisions you make, the votes you take, are there votes taken at these meetings? There are sometimes votes. So we don't even know what the votes are, much less uh, you know, how this report was give, created with this panel. So there is no disclosure from the oversight command. Do Actually, you think that's perplexing or, or strange? Well, we, we have working meetings where we discuss confidential information. We issue a public report every 30 days, yeah. and the report on that vote is made public every 30 days. And each of the members is entitled as part of that process 
to add additional views if they wish to do so. I think it's quite perplexing that, that an oversight panel wouldn't disclose their meetings. Even you can redact confidential information, that's certainly in your capacity, um, which is done throughout government, but it seems like this is a, a very removed from the public and, and, and pretty, pretty non-transparent for a board that is demanding transparency from TARP funds and, and the Treasury in general. Do you find that problematic? Well, uh, what I would find... If she could, if she'd be able to finish. I, I would find it quite problematic if we discussed sensitive information about TARP recipients, about uh, uh, the inquiries and the lines of inquiry that we were pursuing and that were a matter of public speculation as soon as we finished saying it. I, 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 my sense is we need an opportunity to work together and that's what we try to do. But we issue public reports every 30 days and hold public hearings at least once a month. Thank you for the questions, Mr. McHenry. And next, the chair will recognize uh, Mr. Christopher Lee. Five minutes. Give me a minute. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Brofsky, I'd just like to ask a question. I'm going to yield some of my time. But um, just to follow up on some of the discussion we had on the first panel with Mr. Allison, um, it's been mentioned that some companies have been getting mixed signals, mixed uh, answers in terms of what's coming out of Treasury on requirements for paying back. Um, the payments or purchasing the warrants, I guess, what the regulations or stipulations might be for that. There's some frustration. And the work that your office has done or seen, have you found that the government or Treasury has been very clear in terms of what it's actually demanded uh, for repayment of those funds, or has it been foggy? Just curious what your perspective might be on that. With, with respect to the warrants, I, our, our audit is pending and ongoing, so I'm, I'm not really prepared at this time to, to give a, a, you know, sort of a conclusion that would, would come out of that audit. So it's a little bit premature for me to answer that question. Okay. And I, I also have heard from, you know, some in the small business community about the way the stimulus or the TARP funds have been distributed or handled. You know, the committee had a hearing yesterday on the whole issue of too big to fail, the full committee. And one of the things that we think we've missed is sort of the whole too small to save or the concept of what small community banks or small business, what the impact has been on and where the majority of those funds have gone to the larger institutions. But after about six months now, we've seen the administration has started now finally to talk about actually looking at the small business angle and focusing more on that, that direction, which I think is smart and prudent. Uh, and as you know, I think at the first time I go around, earlier this year we had an amendment, but it was before this committee, that would have added authorizing legislation uh, that would have required you to report on small business activity as well as a part of, uh, you know, Sp Special Inspector General's uh, obligations on the next report. Is that something you think you could look at including in your next report, just kind of including uh, some measures on small business uh, participation in the TARP or small financial institutions? I think it would be, what we could do is, is with the information that we already have, maybe perhaps from the survey uh, and what banks are doing with respect to small lending and what they're, what they're saying. We don't really have the resources or mechanism uh, to do exactly what you're saying that really falls on Treasury. I mean, that is, that is a basic part of Treasury's, I think, obligations under you know, under this, this, the concept of transparency, they should be doing that assessment and making that information available. It really goes to the heart of our transparency recommendation about use of funds. How are, how are the institutions using the funds with respect to small businesses and reporting on, in, in their transaction reports, how, what their steps they are taking for small businesses. Um, I'll be happy to, to, to work with you and your staff and have my staff talk to you uh, if we could think out some other ways where we could contribute to that transparency. We're always open to suggestions and, and we, we look forward to following up with you on that. Well, I appreciate that. I, I do want to commend you for your work and you've been very helpful. I know to members on this committee and I'd just like to yield the balance of my time, Mr. Chair, if I could to Mr. McHenry. Thank yes, you. Sir. I thank my colleague from Minnesota for yielding. Uh, Ms. Warren, just to follow up on this again, uh, the fact that there is an unknown budget that hasn't been allocated and to my knowledge uh, from the legislative branch appropriations, there wasn't a line item for that. Um, and, and I would ask the GAO and I'd ask uh, SIGTARP if, if you all uh, could take a look at that and, and perhaps uh, answer how that actually works if the chair doesn't know. Um, additionally, Ms. Warren, I, well, I, I know you don't have purview. I'm, I, my, my apologies. Uh, uh, I'm actually prohibited by statute from doing that. So okay, I just, I just, good. Um, well, it's 
it's late in the day, so obviously we're, I'm missing a few things here. But, um, the, uh, Mr. Warren, uh, you've testified before this committee about the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. That's uh, last month, right? Yes, Congressman. Okay. And I also saw a YouTube video, and I think a few thousand others saw it as well, uh, and your advocacy for uh, CFPA, right? Yes, Congressman. Um, and uh, is that part of your official role as head of the Congressional Oversight Panel? No, it's part of my role as a professor at Harvard Law School. Okay. So that's done through your official resources at Harvard? Yes, it is. Okay. And so through my personal resources, I should say, I wrote a check for it. Okay. Well, YouTube is actually check. pretty cheap, so th thankfully. No, I mean, uh, I wrote a check for the, for the, the, the out-of-pocket expenses to be able to produce uh, uh, the video. Oh, okay. You got a producer. Well, that's good. Well, um, no, I, I understand. A who it's YouTube. I understand. Um, yes. But, you know, and I, there's a lot of conjecture that you'd be the head of the CFPA if, if Congress does pass that. Uh, but no official resources under the Congressional Oversight Panel has been used or staff has been used in no, your advocacy? No. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next, the Chair recognizes Mr. Lee for five minutes. Thank you. Before I start, I do want to thank everybody for your, all three of you, for the support and what you're trying to do to protect taxpayers and the oversight. I'm, it's very commendable. And I'll, I'll start off with Mr. Borofsky, who we've had a chance to meet in the past and, and again, has been very accessible, and I appreciate what you've been doing. Uh, again, one thing that does scare me, however, is the fact that uh, over your, under your oversight at risk, I'd heard numbers anywhere between 2.3 to 2.8 trillion dollars, and that the total potential support government-wide in response to the crisis since 07 could reach close to 24 trillion. Those numbers fairly accurate? Yes. Uh, to explain the, the 24 trillion, though, is, is to put it in context. What, what we did in our report is, in, in section three, we gave a summary of about 50 different support programs outside of the TARP, and for each of those programs, we calculated how much is currently outstanding, what the high water mark was since, uh, since the inception, and then all, what the maximum amount that the, the government has said it would commit to each of those programs. So the amount outstanding is about $3 trillion, the high water mark was about $4.7, uh, and the $23.7 trillion, that represents that if everything was maxed out at once, it's, it's not uh, likely that that would, that would ever occur. But I, I just want to put that caveat on there. Not, not but likely, but a off a scary number all uh, all but together but it is absolutely an accurate number of what the government is committed to do to support the financial system well in, in june the congressional budget office scored the tarp at a loss at taxpayers to roughly 160 billion we're writing off billions in loans to gm chrysler yet it's unclear to me what we are doing with the funds being repaid by the tarp recipients in letters to the secretary of the treasury and to the president which to my knowledge have it to this point been gone unanswered. Many of us on this panel, led by my colleague Mr. McCarthy out of California, have advocated for those repayments to be used specifically to reduce the national debt. Yet others want to recycle these funds and use them for other programs, some of which are brand new. I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, do you believe it's in the best interest of the taxpayer to take TARP repayments to pay down the debt? I mean, our perspective is really a legal one, and I think legally Treasury's treatment of taking um, any interest or dividends and or profits and direct them to reduction of the national debt, that's very clearly what's compelled by law under ESA. Uh, the principal repayments, uh, the Treasury does have its position, and we think that is consistent with the law, is they have the option to re-let that money out up to a, a maximum of $700 billion as long as TARP is in existence. Well, sorry, from your as, long as, is, as long as ESA is... Uh, permits them to do so, which is right now through the end of the year. We, uh, the part that I keep hearing from people, taxpayers, that take the money back and then we throw it out there and, and keep adding more risk and eventually the, the, uh, the debt obligation that we have is, it, is staggered. I'm just curious, Ms. Warren, from your, your point, you've also been an advocate on behalf of consumers, i.e. the taxpayers. I'm curious whether you think taxpayers better served by paying down the debt or spending TARP for other purposes? Well, I, I think, Congressman, this is really the policy choice that Congress should be making. And the legislation is ambiguous on this point, and Treasury has made its position clear 
that it's going to use the headroom analogy that uh, uh, Mr. Allison talked about. So if Congress wants something different, then Congress is going to have to pass legislation, I think, to change that. With that, I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Ms. Bachman, you uh, are up for questions, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I agree. Thank you all for being here. I agree. It's, it's a long day, but you've all been very responsive, and we appreciate um, the great information that you've made available to us. I was curious, I was listening to the previous line of questioning on meetings, and help me, did I understand correctly, and I guess this would be Ms. Uh, Warren, uh, you had mentioned if a member of Congress requested a transcript of one of these meetings of the panel, we could get it. Was that true, or didn't, maybe I didn't understand? You know, Congresswoman, I, I, I was surprised by the question, so let me, let me articulate more clearly. We don't have official transcripts. Uh, unlike your circumstances where there are published transcripts, members go back and they correct the language, we identify who spoke and who did not speak. We have no verified transcripts. We have no official transcripts. We have typing that comes back from someone who listened to our tapes who is not part of our panel, not part of this process, and no one has verified the accuracy of any part of it. So then These, the, the meetings that you have that are not the field hearings, where it's the four, I guess it's four members now, was five members. When the five members meet or when the four members meet, do, are those meetings recorded? We have working meetings that have been recorded. So those meetings are recorded. So are they transcribed or they're just in recorded form? They're, they're in recorded form and as I understand, there is a transcription service. So we can get those transcribed. Well, It's it, possible for us to, to have the I, transcription of those meetings. I, I, I actually, I, I have not considered this question because no one had asked. And I am a little hesitant to commit my co-panelists to um, a process when these are unverified transcripts. That is, something that well, be attributed to someone who is not their co- Well, and that has I never think, been verified. So I think I that's something that, that I would want to know as a member of Congress. If, if the panel is meeting as a right. panel, whether it's the five or the four, and right. if the meetings are recorded, it seems to me that they could be transcribed, and I don't know what the verification process is. The reason why I'm asking is because I had learned yesterday that two requests were made to access those transcriptions and that those requests uh, were not honored. And I, I, I have no reason to doubt uh, the calls for transparency and that the, the Treasury Department wants to be transparent. I have no reason to doubt that at all. But it seems to me that that's in conflict. If on one hand the Treasury Department is saying they want to be transparent, on the other hand, why can't we as members of Congress at least receive transcribed copies? Or, or even if we members of Congress can't receive the copies, couldn't the members of the panel that sit on the panel receive the copies of the transcribed, of the recorded meetings? Congresswoman, you, you may be aware, this is a matter of some discussion within the panel, and the panelists themselves have different views on this. And those views are currently under discussion. We have been trying to work out something that is congenial to all of the panelists. Well, but I have to emphasize, these are working meetings where we discuss lines of inquiry that we are taking No, I understand that, and I understand Congressman McHenry said that it's possible to redact material. One thing I had wondered, and I guess this is a little off point, but does the Congressional Oversight Panel have a phone number? I, I believe we do. Um, you do. Okay. Very good. And can we get it? I, certainly. Okay, so we, then we would be able to call and make that request for the, transcri for, for the recording or the transcriptions. As, as Potentially. I, as I said to Congressman McHenry, I believe it would be the case, and I, I really must add the qualification, I am, as I said before, I am not the entire panel. I have So no decision has been made. No decision has been made about the transparency of those hearings. Uh, we know that they aren't put up on the public for record, but no decision has been made. It just seems to me odd that 
we that if the commitment is transparency that we wouldn't be able to actually receive well, those the, hearings because votes are made in those meetings as i've said congressman these are working meetings i think perhaps the correct analogy would be well, to congressional what's the difference between working meetings and like a and any other meeting what well, would be then the there difference are public meetings where we do not discuss matters that would that should not be in the public domain. But aren't, aren't these public meetings? No, they are not. They're, meeti they're, they're meetings of the committee. These they're, are, they're formal meetings of the committee members, these are, though. These are right? working meetings. No, I don't know what formal means. These are working well, meetings, meetings of the committee. Where the the panelists gentlewoman's time has expired, and I will advise the, wit the members that if they have additional questions or other questions or would like to pursue this, you certainly have a right to submit that in writing. Mr. Chairman. And without objection, the hearing record will be remain open for 30 days for all members to submit written questions and have their responses and the questions put in the record. Mr. Chairman, uh, if, I'm, if I may, just I uh, wanted to clarify what the witness said in answer to my question versus Congresswoman Bachman, and, and I want to make sure that that's, I have the correct understanding. If, Sir, if, we've got another meeting scheduled for this room at 5.30, so I'm going to deny the gentleman's request. I'll ask you. Well, parliamentary you, inquiry. You have a right to submit written questions, and they'll be re answered within 30 days. Parliamentary inquiry. Yes, sir. Is there a, 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 at what point will a transcript of this meeting be available? I don't know that we have a transcript of this meeting. There'll be, yeah, there'll be one. I don't know how long. We've, if the gentleman would yield to me, um, certainly. We got a pretty hard-working staff here. Seriously, we've had a yeah. lot of hearings. Um, but I would say this: rather than wait for a whole transcript, if there's a particular piece that the gentleman's concerned about, we could have the uh, stenographers prepare that piece for him. Certainly. So, thank you. A whole transcript may may take a while. Thank you. Um, but uh, a, a particular piece, we could break it out. So, if you would designate to the staff what you want to look at so you could formulate your question based on that you get it tomorrow okay thank you mr chairman thank you mr chairman and again i just want to thank all of the witnesses for their testimony this afternoon i think this gives us a better understanding of how the tarp process works we need to continue to keep pressing for taxpayer protections throughout tarp and i look forward to working with republicans and democrats these issues should not be partisan at all we're all in this together as well as the Treasury Department, TARP oversight organizations to finish this. And I thank again the witnesses. Uh, this uh, hearing is concluded. The ranking member Judy Baker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding uh, this hearing today, uh, the hearing which is, which is intended to focus on a specific uh, aspect of the TARP program, warrant repurchases and protecting taxpayers. It is in the taxpayers' best interest that as soon as possible the federal government gets out of the trillion-dollar bailout business and out of the practice of owning and running private businesses. This is something the administration also supports. How soon can we withdraw taxpayer money and end the practice of taxpayers propping up industries? Treasury, the Fed, and the FDIC must communicate to the markets and taxpayers the exit strategy and the timeline for it. We need to put an end to the federal government picking winners and losers in the marketplace, which has facilitated unfair competition, competitive advantages for some businesses, and completely abandoned others. It's also in the taxpayers' interest that Treasury secure the best possible return on its investment. I think we'll hear some criticism from some of our witnesses today that Treasury is shorting taxpayers on the investment. From what I understand, this may or may not be true. The accusation may be more for headlines than, than true and is based on differences of opinion as to what is the best modeling metho methodology to value warrants. Whatever the case, taxpayers must be insured, assured that Treasury is using the best means to recapture taxpayers' money. And I hope that uh, Mr. Allison will provide us with those ass assurance today. And I agree with many of our witnesses today that taxpayers deserve transparency with regard to warrants and with regard to what TARP recipients are doing with taxpayer money. At the same time, I want assurances from today's witnesses that as they work to improve TARP transparency, and while TARP is still active, they will not jeopardize Treasury and taxpayers' uh, negotiating position to secure the best return on their investment. It is also vital that we prevent any individual, federal entity, or business involved in TARP from making a profit based on insider information, especially when it is at the expense of the taxpayer. 
That's unacceptable, and I want to know what is being done to prevent this. Finally, I'm disappointed with legislation that would siphon off TARP returns when we still don't have a guarantee that TARP will ultimately, uh, ultimately produce a return or loss for taxpayer. At a time of record deficits and unemployment reaching 10 percent nationwide, any profit on this tremendous risk should first and foremost go towards paying down the deficit. With that, I would like to uh, yield uh, the balance of my time to the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee, uh, Mr. Bacchus. Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Moore, for convening today's uh, important subcommittee hearing on the oversight of the uh, TARP program. And, uh, I uh, also like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Biggert's uh, fine service. Uh, she's been particularly, I think, helpful on, on the issues involving the uh, uh, SEC and the uh, uh, CFTC. I thank you. Uh, last fall, uh, Congress required recipients of assistance under the Capital Purchase Program to issue warrants to the Treasury. Uh, I have a particular interest in this program because I first proposed it or something like it on September the 18th uh, and felt like uh, by setting, uh, you know, a dividend or at least a repayment at a certain percent, uh, I felt like we would be best assured of, of uh, receiving a fair return as opposed to uh, a more uh, uh, fluid definition. Uh, for instance, when you buy toxic assets, and I said that in the very first meeting with uh, Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke, you know, what do we price these at? If you price them uh, too uh, low, it doesn't help the banks with their capital. If you price it, uh, if you pay too much for them, it's a bad deal for the taxpayer. So, I've always thought that this was our best opportunity of safeguarding the taxpayers and yet coming to the aid of the banks, and I think time has shown that to be correct. Uh, and I, uh, Chairman Frank and I and others worked on a bipartisan way on this, uh, uh, along with uh, Representative uh, uh, Roy Blunt. Uh, and this was done so that the American taxpayer would have the opportunity to benefit the warrants, particularly from any upside as these companies return to financial health. And uh, although we, we were hoping that was the case now, some of them have had a spectacular return. And you saw today with uh, Goldman Sachs paying back the money, that was a 23 percent annualized return. Now, that's going to be unusual, I think, but uh, it certainly was uh, good news that it took. Uh, not everybody wanted to go along with this, but we did what we had to do. Uh, and uh, uh, those people who said we didn't need to do this, um, uh, it's a matter of history to judge. But at the, at the present time, we want to wish all of our businesses and banks in the United States success. We want them to succeed. We want them to lend more. And a strong message I'd like to deliver to the banks that our TARP recipients is start lending. Start moving along here. I mean, we have a liquidity issue in the United States that still is out there. And whether or not you're paying back the money or the warrants uh, are going to be exchanged in some form or fashion, we need you to be a part of our recovery. Uh, that being said, the fairness part of this is making sure we get the maximum bang for the buck. And whether it's uh, on an auction uh, or whether there's a wait or not a wait, uh, again, I'll leave that to some of the professionals who can help. Uh, us realize that we get the maximum uh, uh, bit of value back from the banks that uh, end up taking this money. Some of them are now recording historic profits, uh, which again, we wish them all well. Uh, we want that success to uh, filter out to others as well, but uh, we want to make sure that the taxpayers in this country who uh, literally went on the line to make sure the recovery was uh, going to begin, and it seems to be beginning now. Uh, that uh, we can put some of this money back in the till and those banks that may need some additional help and other, uh, others around the United States may get that help. But other than that, we get the maximum dollars back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Klein. The chair now recognizes Ms. Mary Jo Kilroy for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for conducting this hearing. Although I was not part of the 110th Congress and voted no on the House plan to release more money from the Trouble Asset Relief Program, I understand that the American taxpayers took on some risk 
uh, when we uh, work to bail out the banks many of whom made decisions that have hurt Ohio's families and hurt Ohio's economy, in fact, the, uh, hurt our, our country's economy. Now as Main Street still awaits the economic recovery and the jobs that it deserves, some banks are back to making record profits again after receiving our help. And I think that it's appropriate that the American public receives a return on the investment that they made with the TARP money. I find it unacceptable that the downturn hurt Main Street hardest, yet the recovery seems to be benefiting uh, corporate America first. This issue, the repayment of the taxpayers and the upside of warrants is one situation where the taxpayers deserve to reap the full benefits in an open and transparent process. According to the reports that we have received from Dr. Warren, from Mr. Borofsky, the banks and Treasury are ne ne negotiating the repayment of this debt, the purchase and sale of these warrants behind closed doors, instead of allowing the transfer and the trading to happen on the open market and allow the market to set the price. We do not know if the current process is producing the benefits we are owed. However, Dr. Warren has found that we are getting about 66 cents on the dollar for our investment and that the total shortfall to our constituents could be as much as $2.7 billion. A market-based approach would remove the secrecy and special interests and maximize the return on taxpayers' investment. That is why I introduced with six of my colleagues what we call the Profit Act. This logical and common sense bill would maximize profits for our taxpayers and ensure transparency by requiring an open process, eliminating the loophole that allows banks to negotiate behind closed doors with Treasury. The public auction would be such a transparent open market. And I think that um, one of our witnesses, Assistant Secretary Allison, uh, stated uh, earlier this year in his testimony that in relation to toxic assets on bank balance sheets, quote, we have our theories, but in the last analysis, that's why you have financial markets. You have to have liquid interchanges, and then the truth will come out as to what assets are actually worth, quote. I look forward to today's testimony, and I suggest to the panel and to my colleagues that now is the time to act to close this loophole. According to the Congressional Oversight Panel, which Dr. Warren heads, less than 1% of the warrants, those stock options for the American people, have been sold. This is the time to push Treasury to open the process with transparency, and to make sure Americans get the deal that they deserve. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Kilroy, for your uh, statement. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our first witness, Mr. Herbert M. Allison, Jr., the newly confirmed Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. As Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability, Mr. Allison is responsible for developing and coordinating Treasury's policies on legislative and regulatory issues affecting financial stability. Taxpayers. Uh, however, many questions do remain about how to properly uh, value these warrants to ensure that taxpayers receive a proper return on their investment. And I know uh, uh, Ms. Warren, or Professor Warren, or Dr. Warren, uh, uh, you had proposed that they be placed on the open market for sale to the highest bidder. And certainly that, that is, a, uh, you know, one option that you you know, has some appeal, uh, particularly if, if the Treasury and the, uh, the party cannot come to some agreement. I think that's probably the only valid option. Uh, and normally I'd be in favor of, of letting the market decide uh, asset values in all cases. Uh, and uh, I do think that the oversight panel's formula for setting the auction price could result in the holding the, the government having to hold the warrants for an extended period of time, and then you have to you have the risk of another economic downturn. So, you're, if you knew that the economy was going to continue to recover, uh, or the company's prospects, I'd say yes. But you know, you look at the commercial mortgage market and others, and you're it's really a you're you're it's a somewhat speculation and. I've advocated trying to, particularly if the Treasury sets a price and it's accepted, 
let the taxpayers get their money back. We'll go ahead and get that money back in the Treasury where it can uh, be used to pay down the deficit. Um, in the July report on additional views, uh, my colleague, Mr. Hensling, explained that the valuation of the warrants is a highly complex analysis and that a one-size-fits-all approach may not yield the best results for the American taxpayer. You know, I, I agree that that's, that's true. Uh, while the July report seems to paint a picture that some money may be left on the table if, uh, it's, if uh, its valuation formula is not used, uh, I believe that a fair, better result for the American taxpayers, I said, is is to go ahead and, and as soon as possible get the federal government out of the business of holding stocks and warrants of the financial institutions. Uh, and Treasury's indicated that's also their policy. So uh, to get this, the government's investment uh, back as soon as possible. Uh, let me conclude by saying, Mr. Chairman, uh, as institutions begin to pay back their TARP assistance and really capital purchase program, uh, monies. We need to end uh, bailouts, return the money to the taxpayers, not recycle the funds back into more bailouts. And part of that will be regulatory reform to en ensure that we don't have any more bailouts. And I think protection of, of uh, consumers is a part of that. Uh, and although my approach differs from Chairman Frank, I believe that we, what we ought to be doing is saying to the regulatory agencies, which have the skill and the means and the resources to uh, enforce consumer protection, that we give them the charge to do it and tell us how they're going to do it. And uh, if, if uh, over the period of six months to a year we see that's not working, then we could address it in a more, sort of, uh, more novel way. Um, but uh, let's be clear about another fact. Although the capital purchase program may earn a profit, uh, the TARP program overall will not. So for that reason, uh, I believe that all these dividend pay payments ought to be given back to the Treasury as soon as possible. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence in my opening statement. And thank you, thank you as well, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Mr. Klein for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing. And uh, this is one of those hearings we should have a lot more press coverage and a lot more attention to the fact that we're having a pleasant discussion about uh, the TARP uh, and the scenario where not only are large banks that uh, were probably put in a more solid position after what happened in September, uh, but they're, the consideration now is not only paying back the initial capital, but what's going to happen with the bonus? That's the warrants. And for those people who aren't familiar with warrants, that's obviously that upside that we've been talking about all along. So there's a very positive discussion going on here today, and I'm glad that uh, members of both sides of the aisle can, can recognize that. That doesn't mean that things are good for everyone, but this is uh, a little bit of silver lining to the fact that the taxpayers of the United States who put all this money on the table are going to get not only the money paid back, but uh, will share in the upside. Now, that being said, I want to, in my opinion, and I appreciate the, the witnesses today and had a chance to meet with many of you and talk to you about some of the specifics, and I thank you for your service. It's a very important part of the oversight here, is making sure that the taxpayers receive the maximum return for the risk that they took. Known as the TARP. Witnesses include the Treasury Department official in charge of the program and Special Inspector General Neil Borofsky. This is two and a half hours. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations of the House Financial Services Committee will come to order. Our hearing this afternoon is entitled TARP Oversight, Warrant Repurchases and Protecting Taxpayers. We'll begin this hearing with members opening statements up to 10 minutes per side, and then we'll hear testimony from our first witness. After that, members will each have up to five minutes to question our witnesses. I will then excuse our witness and invite the second panel of witnesses to give their uh, testimony, and we'll continue with members' questions. The chair advises members that given the busy afternoon schedule, I'll be keeping everyone, including myself, to five minutes. Any unanswered question can always be followed up in writing for the record. Without objection, all members' opening states, statements will be made part of the record. I now recognize myself for up to five minutes for an opening statement. The past month or two, it's been nice to see some good news regarding the TARP. 
After some upbeat results from the stress test on the largest financial firms, 10 of the largest banks holding companies were authorized to pay back $68.2 billion of TARP funds. If you include smaller banks, a total of over $70 billion has been repaid to U.S. taxpayers. And this news coming after the Treasury Department used more than $200 billion for more than 600 banks to stabilize the financial sector. When Congress enacted TARP last year, we authorized the Treasury Department to request that firms receiving TARP funds issue warrants. This provides an opportunity for taxpayers to share on the upside for their investments. These warrants give us the right to buy shares of a company at a set price at some point in the future, much like an employee stock option. But as you might imagine, whenever the government's the key actor in ex executing these warrants, unlike an employee stock option, there are a number of other policy issues and concerns that we have to be uh, deal with and have to be weighed. Even so, I'm firmly committed to doing all we can to ensure taxpayers are fully repaid. On May 8, Old National Bank Corps became the first TARP recipient bank to repay its TARP funding and repurchase their warrants held by Treasury. The bank paid $1.2 million to buy back these warrants, but what concerned me was a professor from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, Professor Lanus Wilson, analyzed this transaction very closely. He determined that the warrants were worth at a minimum $1.5 million and as much as $6.9 million. So at the low end, Treasury was off by $300,000, and in the worst case, Treasury missed a return of an additional $5.4 million. $5 million might not sound like a lot of money when we're talking about billions of trillions of dollars in financial rescue aid, but if you consider the 600 other banks that will eventually need to repurchase their warrants, this money quickly adds up to a big potential return for U.S. taxpayers. I wrote a letter to Secretary Geithner on June 2nd, urging him in no uncertain terms that he act to protect the taxpayers' investments in these firms by maxima ma maximizing returns on these warrants. I carbon copied SIGTARP, COP, and GAO, and two weeks later I received a joint letter from Special Inspector General uh, Borowski and Professor Warren expressing their commitment to transparency. They noted a coordinated effort between COP and SIGTARP to review quote, whether those warrant repurchasing procedures provide fair value to American taxpayers, end quote. Early this month, I was glad to see COP issue a report entirely focused on TARP repayments, including the repurchase of stock warrants. Similar to the analysis done by Professor, Professor Linus, COP found in the first 11 banks that repurchased their warrants, Treasury was receiving only 60 per, 66 percent of what they could have received for taxpayers. COP notes that these small banks represent only a fraction of 1 percent of all warrants issued, but if this trend continues, taxpayers could miss out on an additional $2.7 billion worth of returns on their investment. But on the same day the COP report was released, we received some good news when Wall Street Journal reported that J.P. Morgan Chase had decided to pursue repurchasing its warrants through a public option. They were frustrated with the Treasury Department for demanding too high a price for their warrants. I'm very glad the Treasury Department's holding a tough line, especially against the largest of the TARP recipients. And today, Goldman Sachs re re announced they'll pay $1.1 billion to redeem their warrants, representing a return of 23 percent for U.S. taxpayers. That sounds pretty good, but it's, is it enough? I'll keep pushing to make sure every single TARP dollar that helps stabilize our financial sector is fully repaid so that our children and grandchildren are not left with a tab. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, especially the new TARP Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability, Mr. Herb Allison. He has one of the toughest jobs in the country, and I look forward to Treasury's viewpoint on how they weigh these difficult decisions to stabilize the financial sector while protecting taxpayers. And the strong oversight Congress put in place when we cre created TARP continues to publish what amounts to thousands of pages of oversight reports, all free and available online, examining every angle and aspect of TARP. Just this week, SIGTARP published their third quarterly report. I look forward to hearing Mr. Borofsky, Professor Warren, and Mr. McCool's testimony today. I now recognize for five minutes the ranking member of the subcommittee, my colleague and friend from Illinois, including administering uh, TARP. Uh, Mr. Allison most recently served as president and CEO of Fannie Mae, as well as the chairman, president, and CEO of uh, TIAA Craft. He has held senior positions at uh, Merrill Lynch, Time Warner, and the New York Stock Exchange. Mr. Allison also spent four years as an officer in the United States Navy, including a year in Vietnam. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record, Mr. Allison. Mr. Secretary, Assistant Secretary, you're recognized for five minutes to provide a brief summary of your statement. Uh, Chairman Moore and Ranking Member Biggert and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss Treasury's efforts to stabilize and repair the nation's financial system. 
In response to the major crisis in our nation's financial system and housing markets, Congress passed the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, or ESA, last October, establishing the Troubled Assets Relief Program, or TARP, and giving Treasury the necessary tools and flexibility to stabilize the financial system and restore the flow of credit to consumers and business. Our mandate in ESA is twofold, to stabilize the financial system while protecting the taxpayers. Today, I want to update you on our progress. In just 10 months, Treasury has invested more than $200 billion in 657 financial institutions of all sizes in 48 states, including over 300 small and community banks through the Capital Purchase Program. We reopened the Capital Purchase Program recently for small and community banks, recognizing the critical role these banks play in our communities. We provided support to three systemically significant institutions. We launched an unprecedented housing program to help millions of homeowners. We assisted with restructuring of both General Motors and Chrysler through the bankruptcy process. And as a result, both companies are better able to compete today. We helped to restart the securitization markets, a key source of credit to consumers and businesses. We launched a public and private investment program to help remove legacy assets from the balance sheets of financial institutions so they can redeploy their capital to support lending. And we issued regulations guiding executive compensation at all firms receiving TARP funds. We have allocated about $643 billion to our ESA programs. We've actually invested $362.6 billion of that amount to date. We've also received over $70 billion in uh, CPP payments from 34 institutions and $6 billion in dividend repayments from participants in all the TARP programs. And finally, we're beginning to receive proceeds from the sale of warrants through the CCP. And as was noted today, we received $1.1 billion from Goldman Sachs, representing a return of 23.15% on the taxpayer's money. As you can see, Treasury has accomplished a great deal, all while building a new Office of Financial Stability. However, we have much more to do, as described later in my testimony. I would like to briefly discuss Treasury's process for selling the warrants it has received through the CPP. I've attached our policy statement and our frequently asked questions on this subject with my testimony for the record. Treasury has communicated its consistent and clear process for valuing warrants in a manner that protects taxpayers. We apply the same process consistently for all banks, large and small. Treasury is committed to getting fair value for the taxpayers for these warrants, and we've made that process public on our website. When a publicly traded institution repays Treasury's investment under the CPP, it has the contractual right to repurchase its warrants at fair market value through an independent valuation process directly from Treasury. One source of complexity in valuing warrants is that the warrants do not trade on any market, so they don't have observable market prices. Models by themselves cannot give us reliable estimates of the realizable price in the marketplace. So we're using a comprehensive approach to estimating these values, which involves a variety of inputs, including a set of well-known financial models. In developing our valuation and repurchase process, we counsel with numerous experts, market makers, and industry participants. Treasury also consults with third-party market participants as to what they'd be willing to pay for the warrants, and we obtain full independent valuations from outside investment managers. Treasury decided to sell the warrants within several months after they're eligible for sale, rather than hold them for a substantial period. Our guiding principle is the President's belief that the extraordinary government interventions necess necessitated by the crisis should be unwound as quickly as is consistent with Treasury's mandate under ESA to restore liquidity and stability to the financial system while protecting the interests of taxpayers. As with all aspects of our financial 